Okay, we're we're live. Thank you. If I could, if I could get everybody to take your seats, please. We're on air. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I'm calling this regular meeting of the Board of Directors Golden Rain Foundation to order. This is Tuesday, December 5th, 9.30 a.m., of course, in the community center in the boardroom. I'm going to ask Director Phelps to please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I hope everyone's doing fine this morning. Uh, do we have the media? Where is our... I don't see, okay. I don't see her, she'll probably come in in a few minutes. Um, item four, how about approval of the agenda? Can I get a motion to approve the agenda? Second. Are you getting, are you getting? Consent calendar. They did? All in favor? The agenda? How about discussion? Do we have any discussion on the agenda? Yes, yes we do. I'd like yes, to move no. on. That's right. Okay. On the consent calendar, I'd like to on the consent calendar, I'd like to move eleven A uh, to twelve C. Take it off the consent calendar and put it up for discussion. I'll second that. I'll second that. Any further discussion? All in favor? Okay. Unanimous? Okay, motion passes. Any anything else with the agenda? Anyone else? Okay. Item five, approval of the minutes. Of the meeting November 7, 2017. Also move. So move. Second. And then comments? Discussion? Thank you. Um, I, it was pointed out to me that in approving the minutes, I neglected to uh, include under others president, the president of United, Juanita Skillman, who somehow or other managed to speak without being present. Uh, but now if we put her on, she'll be present. Do we have any other omissions of people? No. Thank you. And I believe, Diane, you caught a really important one. Uh, yeah, I think it got to be changed. It hasn't been. I've got it if you don't. It's on page three of 22. Uh, yeah, it was on page five of 22. Uh, on the schedule of golf fees that we listed members as opposed to residents, that that should be residents, not members. John? Also on page three of 22, it should read, introduce a golf, uh, including one rate for all residents instead of members and non-members. One rate for all residents. Any other amendments? Correct. With those uh, amendments, all in favor? Again, unanimous. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> well, let me see. Which is the next item? I think it's me. 
Report of the Chair. Again, good morning to everyone. As the new president of GRF, the first thing I want to do is to thank my fellow board members who voted for me and given me this huge honor to lead such a prestigious group of people. I also want to send a thank you from my heart to my dear friend, the late Bill Blaine, for urging me to run for the United Board of Directors in the first place. Bill truly loved this community and wanted best for all of us. <clears throat> Next, <laughs> as a leader of this board, I ask that we work together as a team, each of us showing the dignity and respect that we all deserve. I like to sometimes say, staying in your lane. And what I mean by that is all of us will work hard on our own committees and our own path and not jump over the lane into someone else's path. We're gonna work really hard not to do that. That causes a lot of conflict, a lot of misinformation, and it's just not the way I believe we should move forward. On behalf of this board, I pledge to the residents of this entire Laguna Woods Village that we will work for each of you with the highest degree of integrity, unity, transparency, and above all, honor. We will employ a system of what I call servant leadership to accomplish the goals that you, the stakeholders, and the community, and the residents want. In order to help us do that a little more efficiency, efficiently, we're gonna make a few administrative changes. When people wanna speak, we would, we would also ask besides your name and your manner number that you tell us what area you're concerned about, such as I got a question about uh, maintenance and construction, or I got a question about security or whatever. And the reason I would like you to do that, if you can, is that the chairs of our committees, which today we will announce, will be responsible for responding directly to you at the conclusion of all the speakers. We will no longer have 11 people trying to talk to you and give you information. It will be one person. The chair of that committee or that area will be responsible to you and me. We, we are extensively, I am extensively reviewing re responsibilities of the chairs and making them or asking them to step up their game. Uh, as you might notice, there has been some questions about one of our committees. Uh, after consultation with many members, we are suspending the landscaping committee for a period of three months. Recently, <clears throat> the garden center's responsibility has been moved into uh, community activities and the recreation department under Brian Gruen. So we're gonna take a look at and just see if we really need to have a separate landscaping. And if we do, we'll bring it back. I will assure the residents that if it is necessary, we'll bring it back. But remember, uh, it's, it, every committee costs staff time and, and I, I don't want double work, but Again, we will assess it. It's only a suspension, not what some people think it might be. Um, ah. In January, we have scheduled what I'm going to term a team summit. And we will be learning new ways of being more efficient, more professional, <coughs> responsive to the residents, and more as a team and less of 11 individual directors. And I hope that message that I have said maybe four times is, is on point and people are understanding what, where we're going and how we're gonna get there. Again, it is my honor to serve this community and to work with these esteemed directors. Thank you. Now, VMS. VMS, item seven, VMS, Director Scheinman. God, I hope I said that right, Lucy.
Good morning, everyone. Yes, Tom, you said it right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, our schedule of meetings at VMS these days is every other week. Uh, some months, there's a third Wednesday in the month, so we meet three times. Uh, we were scheduled to meet twice. So anyway, this month we had three meetings. On the first one, we had reports from department head Tim Moy and Chuck Howland. And Tim discussed the great shakeout and what a success it seemed to be. Uh, Chuck Holland briefed us on the new management system, which is HRIS, is the software-based punch clock that will allow more precise timekeeping and manpower reports. We're going to watch them, and they're going to work harder. Harder still. Uh, on November 15th, our meeting was with Chris Spar, who is the person in charge of resident services. And if you've had occasion to call, you know that it's a whole new ball game from a year ago. Uh, they are set a goal of answering within 20 seconds, and they've made it by 90%. The place where it has always fallen down is the communication between where you complain and where something happens. And this is what has been worked on and worked on and worked on. And I think we're, we're making progress. Uh, I know the results are occurring more rapidly, astoundingly more rapidly. <laughs> Several years ago, I had an incident where one of the split rail from a fence behind my house fell down. And it sat there for a good six months before it was repaired. This is several years ago. This time, I noticed one of my neighbors had one fall down, and within two weeks, it was fixed. So there's a difference. I know there have been complaints, and I hear them just like everyone else. And we hear why it's the way it is. It's like they got to catch up. And of course, the subject of the most of the complaints has been landscape, and it's too bad, but it's, it's getting there. If you have occasion to ride around your neighborhood, you'll see that there's a, five trucks parked in front of one area, and there's piles of greenery in, in uh, can, um, bags waiting to be hauled away. It used to be they'd get it all hauled away before the end of the day. Now, sometimes it sits there overnight. There, rather than on your lawn, which is an improvement, <laughs> I remember out of the far past when somebody put a bag, a burlap bag of greenery behind a tree so it wouldn't be so obvious, and it sat there for a week before they came back for it because it wasn't very obvious to anybody, including them. Uh, doesn't happen anymore, and once they get to you, you'll be caught up. So be patient if you're not getting taken care of yet. I see him one cul-de-sac down from me, so I'm expecting service in the near future. But that would be the second time this fall, so that's great. Uh, our meeting on November 29th, we had Lori Moss with the new, well, I'd say with the old strategic plan, which is pretty much completed. Everything has been taken care of or rescheduled to the future. So we, uh, our president, uh, our, ch our chairman, Dan Kenny, asked for, give us some more strategy for the future. So that will be getting soon. Uh, tomorrow is another G uh, VMS meeting, and our speaker will be Ernesto Munoz, who will talk about the epoxy waistline progress in United and the prospective handyman service for third. And that I am waiting for, along with a lot of other people, I think, because 
when we hear what they're, I've, we've heard before what they are expected to try to do, and it sounds wonderful, and we'll find out the details tomorrow. So it, expect to hear about it, because it probably would start the first of the year. Look forward to it. Uh, a couple of comments on the, the activities that we've had in the last several weeks. There was a hoedown in November, and congratulations to Lisa Toomer, who did all the planning and organizing for that. Uh, Heather Rasmussen has, uh, is in charge of the club calendar, which is now online in the BLAST. Don't know what the BLAST is, but the presidents of the organizations and clubs will know and now they can schedule their own events on the calendar. So this is a big step forward. I guess you don't have to drag your body into the great hall here in order to make your future reservations. And a couple of comments from residents. Thank you to Luis Lopez and his crew for a job well done. That was about landscape maintenance in 34-25. And another group from 135B said, thank you for the recreation holiday event on Saturday. This was a two-hour event in Clubhouse 2. The Dickens singers were magnificent, and our three-year-old grandson was mesmerized by them as were all the attendees. The snow machine was a big hit. If you didn't bring a little one, it was precious seeing the, the children's reaction to this. So we're getting a variety of things. We seem to be having recreation events scheduled for young children, a lot of them, and we're getting good re reactions from them. So VMS is out there watching out for your interests. If you want, have any questions, suggestions, we listen too. And sometimes we're in a better position to help than GRF. Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> no, but we have a direct pipeline to the people that are going to put the pool covers on every night. <laughs> that's, that's my private <laughs> bug. They hadn't been doing it. And I wasn't around. I wasn't able to go to the pools for a couple of months. So it, when I went back for the first time last week, I discovered that they still weren't covering the pool. Well, if it's 50 degrees at night, you can heat all day and all night, and you're not going to have a hot pool. So uh, I made personal influence on that, and hopefully it's, it's going to be fixed. So thank you. It's a pleasure reporting, and it's exciting to me to be attending the different BMS meetings and knowing what's coming ahead of time and on a personal level. So thank you all. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, they brought in some Print more printed agendas in case Correction. Anyone... Handyman is for everybody. <laughs> okay. okay. I also, uh, during my comments, wanted to acknowledge the membership of the new directors for the Golden Rain Foundation uh, publicly, Mr. Matson, Mr. Johan, and Ms. Sewell. Uh, appreciate joining the team. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Report of the chair, Mr. Brad Hudson, please. Uh, thank you, Honorable President, members of the board, uh, members of the community. It's always uh, fun to come and <coughs> share with everyone what's going on out there, and it's, uh, it's a pretty exciting time. I'm very glad that the budget and the elections are over. Uh, those very intensive uh, uh, long-term projects, and so now we can get back to, uh, to uh, serving our residents exclusively and directly, which is the best part of this work for me. And so, uh, as always, I, I meet with many, many residents every week, and, and I appreciate you 
taking time to come and share your concerns with me, and, and uh, I, I hope that, that I'm usually helpful when you do come. One of the big things going on right now is the El Toro Water District uh, reclaimed water project. If you live in Gate 9 or drive through Gate 9, you kind of see the activity uh, going on there. That's one phase of the project. It is uh, literally under construction. And then if you go in Gate 5 now, you'll see uh, all the asphalt markings and the dig alerts and all that going on because that's the second phase that's going to start in the next, next couple of months. So. Uh, at the end of that, it'll be a little bit disruptive in terms of getting in and out of those gates for a while and, and traversing around the construction. But in the long run, uh, you'll be getting cheaper water for your landscaping, uh, non-potable. Uh, that's good for the environment. And also a lot of new asphalt, which is a good thing as well. So free asphalt and cheaper water, it's probably worth a little bit of uh, inconvenience. Here at the community center, um, you're going to start noticing a little construction as well as we um, uh, implement kind of the long-awaited uh, and much talked about, Juanita, um, uh, call center resident services improvements uh, to make it much, much better uh, for you uh, when you call or come in, and also to separate manner alterations out of that resident services environment. Manor alterations are complicated a lot of times. They take a long time. And so a lot of that is better done on an appointment basis where you can sit down at a table, lay out plans, have a discussion, call experts down if you need some help. And that does not really fit well with coming in and, and having a real quick interaction, you know, paying a bill or, or getting a uh, an ID card, those sorts of things, a decal, things that are pretty quick. And so we're going to separate those functions out. Uh, we're seeing a much improved service. A lot of times uh, the lines are almost non-existent uh, in resident services. Uh, people do like to come at lunchtime, though. So if you don't want to wait, don't come at lunchtime. Um, uh, come early in the morning or a little later in the afternoon, and, and you'll zip right in there uh, without a worry. So. Just trying to spread the uh, spread the good word about times to to come. So we anticipate that starting uh, rather quickly, with the first phase of that being some changes to the printing services, and 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 the manner alterations uh, piece, which is going to be going kind of where social service parts of social services are right now, and so it'll be separated out a little bit. And then next will come the resident services area, and, and then lastly security services up on the third floor. So uh, we're still working out the interim piece of, well, where's resident services going to be while they're building that? And right now, and it's a horrible, horrible answer, but the only one we have is probably on the third floor. And so that's going to be a, a bit of a challenge. Uh, it'll only be very short term. We're using all mo modular furniture. There won't be, there'll be very little hard construction there. And so it should happen very quickly and move that down back down to the first floor. So you might have noticed as well that there's changes uh, to, the, to the doors here at the community center. And so we had a very inefficient system here, and we were losing a lot of our heat and cooling uh, uh, due to, number one, the, the, the way the doors are, are, are located uh, at each end of the building, and then also how long the automatic doors stay open and their use by virtually everybody who comes into the building. And so we've made some changes here to use the automatic door. Now you have to push the button. We ask that if you don't need the automatic door, don't push the button. Um, and then uh, as well, we have, we have some, uh, some air curtain systems there as well that keep the air in the building in when the doors are open and, and, and the outside air out. And so we think between those two things, we're probably looking at somewhere along a maybe a 20 percent, uh, 15 percent increase in efficiency in our air systems here. Um, this is this building and maintenance are, are two big energy users for GRF. And so uh, the next piece of this is in your business plan for next year is, is a new HVAC for this building, which is desperately needed. Anybody that works here or spends any time here knows that. 
Um, I mean, it's, you know, it's 20 years old. That you know, it's. Uh, I think you got a pretty good ride out of it. Um, so that'll be replaced and, and and also incorporated into our EMS system. We anticipate saving quite a bit of money on that uh, as well. Um, you know, we just uh, changed some surveillance cameras at the golf course, and it turned out really nice. Uh, and so we're going to be doing that in the several other areas as well. Um, primarily, where areas where we just need to see what's going on, or perhaps uh, we've had some activities uh, that that we want to discourage. And so I know uh, you find, may find this hard to believe, but we had some theft at the at the pro shop in the golf course, and. Yeah. The video cameras were of such a poor quality, we couldn't identify uh, the perpetrators. And so we, we put Mr. Holland on the job, and, and now I, I think we can probably get a fingerprint off the cameras. You know, it, it really, uh, he's really got a good system in there, and so we want to deter that. But there are other areas of the community where we have uh, illegal dumping or other activities that we want to discourage, and we might, might deploy some surveillance there as well to discourage some of those real uh, um, nasty sorts of activities we want uh, want to cease. Um, Lucy mentioned it a bit, and it's been quietly ongoing for a long time. And this is our uh, HRIS or Human Resources Information System, which which uh, we thank the GRF Board uh, for publishing. And so uh, this is is really kind of dovetails in. And while it's not quite the same magnitude. Uh, of say Dynamics AX, it's, that's our new financial system. It, it's similar and, and dovetails right in. Uh, we had about a 15-year-old uh, 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 system that didn't take applications online, uh, didn't allow supervisors to see which employees had requested vacation before approving the next request. I was a victim of that myself, uh, as one day I showed up at the office on Friday and I was the only one there. And over the previous year, I had approved vacation for everybody in the office, literally. So I answered the phones and took care of it. It was my fault. And, uh, but I'm told with this new system, it literally won't let me do that. Um, that when I, with an online approval, if, if too many people are off, it'll say, hey, you're going to be alone. If you push this button, you, you can't do it. And so things like that, all your allocations for all the mutuals uh, of, of the time that employees work on various activities, a much more sophisticated uh, approach to that. It just has so many, so many features and is, is really going to be a huge, huge increase in efficiency in virtually every area. So we're very excited. It, is, it eliminates paper checks. Yes, a lot of our employees still get paper checks. Uh, we don't issue them anymore. Uh, and so you either have a direct deposit or you'll, you'll get a debit card that will fill up every month. Um, but no more paper pay stubs. Every payday, somebody goes around with 900 pay stubs and hands them to people. No, go online and look at your pay stub if you want to see it. Um, we're not going to print it out and hand deliver it to your desk anymore. So all those sorts of things are coming to an end, and it's going to be, I think the ROI on this is going to be very, very, very rapid. And, and even if it, it wasn't, the efficiency increases are so dramatic that it, it, it's really indicated. I think we were eight versions behind in terms of the updating on this. So this is going to be a big, big plus, and I thank you. And so that only leaves one really major system now that we haven't done. You've allocated resources for it, and that's the, uh, the CRM and the customer uh, relationship management piece. And so we're looking at options uh, for that right now. I know it's, it's high on, on uh, Chuck's list as soon as he finishes the HRIS and the other 20 things we've got him working on. I wanted to talk a little bit because we're just now starting. I know many of you have been working on it. We've talked about it. But the, the analog deletion, and maybe we should change the name of it. Uh, we've been calling it the analog deletion and, uh, program. And that is uh, the big TVs that are really heavy, that are more than about two inches thick. Over the next year or so, they're going to have less and less utility for you um, as we're going to, to stop uh, broadcasting in analog. Um, and over, it's a slow approach. And so in order to use a TV like that, you know, the big ones that you can't pick up by yourself, um, you um, would have to acquire a little box that we have here. And, and we can talk about that. And we're going to be sharing a lot of information. Um, and you might say, well, why are we doing this? And isn't there a better 
a better name for this, and I, I think there is, and I would call it the, maybe the, the bandwidth improvement program. You like that? Joan, this is your, your baby. Bandwidth improvement program. So why do we need to do this? Well, gee whiz, when we were, all this was going on, you know, 10 years ago, we had 1,000 internet customers here at the village. And so we, oh, we had all the bandwidth in the world. Well, now we have 10,000 internet customers. And guess what? They're not satisfied with five megabytes anymore. They want 100 because um, they want to watch movies and they want to download stuff and, and, and do all kinds of, uh, of robust uh, interactions uh, over the internet. And so in order to create the bandwidth so that we can serve you, because internet and cable run through the same pipe, then we need to really cease the analog uh, broadcast. And virtually every other cable company, I wouldn't say in the country, because um, there's probably somebody out there still doing it, but the, I'm not aware of anybody personally and, and certainly not aware of anybody that's doing that in California. Um, you can't buy the equipment anymore. There's, we've got like the last guy that works on this equipment in the area. And, and, and he is well beyond retirement age and we're incentivizing him to stay every day so we can keep this stuff up and running. Um, but the equipment can't be serviced. They're, you know, it's not manufactured anymore. You, you really have to go on eBay to find the stuff if something breaks. Um, so it's just time, time that we, we move on, provide the better internet service, provide a high quality DVR experience that allows you to record as many programs as you want at once and to easily go over the top to Netflix and Hulu and other avenues where you can acquire content in a much more efficient and cost-effective way. And so that, that's where we're, we're headed. We're going to take a slow approach. We do have the devices. Uh, if folks want to continue using their analog TV, they can. I don't recommend it because I think the device costs, you know, 40 or 50 bucks and I think you can buy you can buy a 20-inch uh, 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 digital TV for probably the similar amount, maybe 60 bucks. They're, they're not real expensive. And so uh, my advice would be to scratch the, even though we make a little money on the boxes, the little tiny boxes, I'm glad to sell them to you. But for your viewing pleasure and better reception and all that, you're better off not buying the little box from us, but going ahead and, and just getting uh, a digital TV. So there's going to be a lot on that. A lot of information. We've got a like a 20-minute TV show we're doing on it, so people understand everything that's going on. Uh, I've been kind of publishing it on the crawl. Haven't got a lot of. That's the little thing on on TV six. We're gonna have a town hall. Uh, we're gonna send out. We're doing an article in the breeze. We'll have a lot of information out there on this. And anybody that has any questions can always always call Chuck um, and ask him why the heck are you doing this to my old TV. Um, and, and talk to us and we'll share the information uh, with you. Um, but it's, it's not going to be a rush to judgment. We've been talking about this. Joanne, Joan, I think 10 years. Uh, it's been a long time. Well, no, but the community. The community. Because um, that's when I, I'm trying to remember when my cable company stopped, stopped offering that. And it, it's got to be 10 years ago. It's been a long time. I actually think you're right. I think that started in 2002. 2002. So it's been a long time coming, and so I, I just want to, to make sure that whenever I have an opportunity, either here or, or on Village Television, that I touch base on this, um, because I, I don't want anybody to, to be shocked, you know, when, when slowly, over the period of a year or so, channels start disappearing on their analog uh, uh, broadcast. And so that's kind of how this will happen. But there's much more information to come. Uh, like I said, town hall in January, and we're very, uh, very pumped up uh, right. about doing that. Could, could you just make a comment about digital TVs? Because it's not going to have the problem we thought it was going to No, have. if you have a digital TV, um, as we make these changes, you'll have to scan, channel scan occasionally because we'll, we'll, we'll change the lineup by deleting channels. And so we'll send e-blasts and information out to folks saying, hey, if you've got a digital TV, you know, we made some changes to the lineup, so you need to, to rescan your channels to get everything lined up properly. So it'll be an ongoing process. We thought it would be, be easier this way than just flipping a switch and having at the end, 
you'll still be able to see something with analog, but it'll be at the jewelry channel and, uh, you know, things, things like that. Um, and so <laughs> I suspect that's not a, a big viewing option for our residents. But, so, but we don't think people with digital TVs will end up No, I think they'll be fine. They'll be fine. They'll just have to have to update their, their channel guide. And then, uh, like I said, there'll be a lot of information coming on that uh, before we, we start uh, making those changes. We want to make sure everybody knows what's going on. And we want to help anybody that's got a, a special problem. And so we're going to be there before you on that. So lots more information to come. I did want to, uh, to thank Brian and, and, and his staff, uh, Jennifer, Laura, others who put on the, uh, the holiday event. That was a, a pretty good event. We had, I don't know, three or 400 people there who, who enjoyed uh, uh, holiday spirits. Mrs. Claus, I'm told, was there, and they had a pile of snow, and uh, everybody had a had a really uh, really good time. And I did want to thank also our transportation staff and recreation. We're doing a what's well, trying to be a pretty good bus trip to Mission Viejo for their kind of light event, um, and I think we're taking five buses and you know a little over 100 uh, residents to uh, to take that tour and so on the bus. So that'll be good. And then just a, a heads up, it's getting pretty, I know it seems like it's far away, but it's pretty close to New Year's. We put on a number of events. And uh, uh, you might want to make your reservations early. We'll be sending information out on that as well. If you want to participate in, in some of our events, we, we would love to have you. And, and uh, we'd like to help you get back and forth safely as well if you, if you choose to uh, maybe have a, an alcoholic beverage uh, on that most festive occasion. So thank you. And, uh, Happy to answer any questions or address any comments the board may have. Board members, any questions to Mr. Hudson? Thank you, Brad. Thank you. Okay, item nine, the open forum. <clears throat> Again, anyone who wants to speak on any topic that's not on the agenda, please fill out a card, come forward. We'll, we'll, I think we'll call your call you up. Please, again, if you can, put a topic down, and I'll remind the chairs to pay attention to the topic so they can respond to them. Um, you have a maximum of three minutes. So who's first? First up, we have Ralph Blitz. And after Ralph will be Joe Fitzhim. Okay. Do I speak? Ralph Bielitz, one, two, four. Uh, my main uh, complaint today is the, the raise in the golf fees. I think uh, you guys are being prejudiced towards golfers. I only see one avid golfer here that I know, and that's Tom Circle. That's just one uh, deal I know. I don't know. If, we have golf fees. Around. I don't know what's going on, but all of a sudden we need a lot of money around here. I thought this uh, new uh, deal was going to save us money. This is the biggest raise, a 50% raise in golf fees that I've ever seen. I've been here 20 years. I mean, it, it, uh, it doesn't make sense to me. When the tennis players don't pay nothing, the pickleball going to get a half a million, probably going to end up being a million dollar court. Swimmers, $2 million a year we're spending on them. I mean, they work the numbers. I was talking to somebody just a little bit ago told me that the golf course does not support itself. Well, I've heard time and again, we're doing over 100,000 rounds of golf there. Now, nobody seemed to know, is that nine holes or 18 holes, uh, when I ask uh, the information. That's my main thing already. Uh, Golfers are already paying, I don't know if people even know this, you pay $60 for a trail fee just to drive your cart on these cart paths, which are very nice. I can't complain about it. But uh, uh, what else do I have here? High school kids. Now, I haven't seen the high school kids play lately. But I don't know why we have to be Santa Claus to these high school kids from wherever they're coming from. I followed these kids a couple years ago. Their coaches should have known better. They were following them in the cart. They drive the cart up right next to the green, which you don't do. Uh, it damages the grass. The kids do not carry sand with them. You're supposed to put sand when you dig out the grass 
which we are told to do, and we do. Break the sand traps, they probably do that. But uh, I, I, there's enough golf courses around here where I think it should be aldermated. Why should Laguna Woods be the main source of, of them? And uh, okay. Uh, are, and also, are they insured? What if, um, does mommy and daddy sign their uh, a waiver so that uh, if they get hurt or hurt somebody else? Yes, they do. What I'm wondering, I heard a comment or read a comment not too long ago where you guys have no control over wages here. I don't believe that. I used to be in a union. There's negotiations. Are these guys getting away with something that PCM did not let them do? Or is their rates getting too high? I mean, <laughs> these are things that you have to look at. Uh, golf building, I don't know if that's included in the fee for golfers, but uh, it's not really a golf building. Golf, the biggest room in there is where the golf carts are kept down in the basement. We don't even have enough room for our club to have a meeting there. Uh, so, also, uh, last thing, last but not least, security. I walk at night a lot in United Mutual. I very seldom see a car, a truck. I used to see them making their rounds through every cul-de-sac at least once or twice in a half hour to an hour walk. I'm not seeing them. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Okay, next up is Joe Fitzham. Yes, good morning. I want to thank Mr. President for his opening comments. I thought that was very kind and love to see that type of motivation for the board. Appreciate all the board members here. Winston Churchill once said, a lie can travel halfway around the world before the truth can put his pants on. I aspire to speak to ethics and accuracy in dealing with each other. You must never let your heart or personal interest conflict with your real mission to be fair to every resident and organization in Laguna Woods. If you do not feel for all of us, then you cannot feel for any of us. No one can expect you to know everything, but you must be cautious in the words of others when they are affected by political influences or personal reasons. Trust and verify, then act in good conscience. I firmly believe you are all dedicated and sacrificed so much for all of us in this community. I thank all of you for your challenging service on our behalf. I have seen the pain you sometimes feel. In the near future, we will learn some new truths. Protect the best of us and help those who, with real need to maintain the common good. Reject the arrogance and selfishness and demands of those who care only for themselves. In the words of Albert Einstein, who is ever careless with the truth in small matters, cannot be trusted in important matters. So I bid you all the good conscience. I hope all of you have, have all the best decisions you can, and that all of us give you the best information we possibly can. Thank you very much for your service. Thank you, Joe. Cheryl. Next up is Chris Collins. Good morning. Chris Collins, 3306Q. Today I'm here to give an update on another aspect of the work done by the Foundation of Laguna Woods Village on behalf of all village residents. Donations to the Foundation of Laguna Woods Village help keep the holidays bright for needier residents in the village while also helping throughout the year. This year, donations have permitted the foundation to adopt 150 seniors in the village who needed some extra holiday cheer. With the help of social services and the South County Outreach Food Pantry, the foundation was able to identify those in needs of holiday cheer and provide village seniors with both a special holiday meal and a gift something they would not have had otherwise. The holiday meal could take the form of a cooked dinner or a Stater Brothers gift card, so the recipient would be able to cook their own meal. In addition, each participant was given a gift card to either Target or JCPenney to purchase a gift of their own choosing. While a special effort is focused on the holidays, donation, um, donations in response to the Foundation's recent appeal permit the foundation to provide temporary financial assistance to village residents and to build on partnerships of helping. For example, in addition to its regular efforts, the foundation is currently focusing on ensuring needy residents can avail themselves of two simple emergency care measures, which can be life-saving on occasion. One is the medical alert systems, 
and the other is the care ambulance policies to ensure affordable ambulance transport when a medical emergency arises. For more information about obtaining these emergency measures due to financial need, please contact Social Services at 949-597-4267 or contact the Foundation online at the foundation at comline.com or by telephone 949-268-2246. Thank you very much and thank you for all of your unbelievably difficult service in tithing your time to making this community better. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. It's actually very rewarding. It really is. Next so. up is Sally Sonderhaus. Good morning. Sally Sunderhouse, 580 Unit O. This is, ended up being a little out of order. We, I have some friends here who are also going to speak on this subject. Uh, I'm one of the Creekside re residents who for years uh, attended monthly landscape and GRF meetings in our quest to restore Aliso Creek to the state it was in prior to the replacement of the now notorious footbridge. We were repeatedly told by the prior landscape department management and the government that the government agencies would not permit restoring the creek to its pre-construction state. We repeatedly commented that we had had conversations with the government agencies and they did not concur. Surprisingly, at the May 21st, 2015 landscape meeting, the landscape department proposed actions and a schedule to accomplish the very task we had been requesting. We were essentially told GRF could obtain default approval from the agencies, provided the work was done during the appropriate months and was done with the proper controls to, to protect the aquatic wildlife. We were, to put it mildly, ecstatic that the cattails would finally be removed, the willows relocated, and we looked forward to the water flowing in the creek again. Imagine our surprise when with the subsequent change of the chairmanship of the committee, the projects were eliminated. We hope that the new landscape supervision and a new board, the creek can be restored to something approaching its former glory. Thank you. I also want to say thank all of you for your willingness to serve on this board. I know it is a huge commitment of time, energy, and probably generally a thankless job for all of you. But I have high hopes for your success. And thank you. Bye. Thank you, Sarah. Happy Halloween. Next up, we have Elizabeth Morris. Elizabeth Morris, 581, Unido. Avenue to Mallorca. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm one of the friends and neighbors that she's referring to. And I'm going to speak to about the, uh, about the park in the creek. But I want to welcome you as new elected officers, and I commend you for your service. I hope that you will govern wisely, and I'm happy to hear about the transparency. Um, on November 23rd, 2017, the Globe newspaper published an article about Aliso Creek park and the current condition of the creek. Several persons were interviewed by the magazine, uh, by the reporter, and the advocates who have been involved with the creek were concerned about one of the statements. And I quote, the Lisa Creek issue is beyond the board's range of authority and that their hands are tied, end quote. The advocates of the creek beg to differ with this statement. Their hands are tied as they have met personally and or talked with the first three government agencies listed in paragraph two of the GRF memorandum dated August 20, 2015. This was a long list of agencies that were supposed to be controlling us. We do not dispute federal and California waterway authority, but the interpretation of it. Our experience has shown these government agencies are concerned and responsive, been extremely helpful to us. We have found that they are not resolute in demanding ultra strict riparian measures. In view of information the advocates have received from these agencies in the past four years, we wonder what legal documents exist that dictate Park Creek care 
to such an extreme extent that it has tied the hands of the DRF board. Have such documents ever been published and made available to all residents? If so, we have not seen them. When we talked to the Fish and Wildlife relating the fact that Landscape Department had totally disregarded the CFW stipulation not to disturb plantings and wildlife habitat when replacing the footbridge, we were astonished to learn there was no penalty for disregarding the stipulation, no fine, no admonishment. CDFW regretted the unhappy results of the work, but that was it. Later in the research, we were discovered, justified, there is no government agency that mandates billows, particularly in a creek of the size in our park. It seems clear that reasonable efforts to maintain a clear, clean, free-flowing creek will not result in a prison term, not even a slap on the wrist. If landscape personnel had fewer constraints, they could use their skills to give more thorough care to the park creek and still meet agency guidelines. In conclusion, it appears the Big Brother Creek control is not a reality but a myth. Fear of agency oversight is detrimental. It should be disregarded when planning for the environmental welfare of our community. Any current constraints preventing a bright future for the Creek Park and should be thoroughly examined. All pros and cons should be held uh, openly on the table, laid openly on the table, and for the residents in GR4 to view in order to reach a shared decision. On behalf of all the Park Creek people who love the park, I hope this presentation will be taken to heart by the board and positive action will result. And I thank you too for all your hard work and your attention. Thank you, Elizabeth. Very well spoken. Next up is Sharon O'Neill. Good morning. Sharon O'Neill, 581P. Thank you for serving on the board and congratulations. I'm speaking concern about the creek as well. I purchased a home here in 2012, and I chose a location along Aliso Creek Park because I enjoyed the natural setting and the water views. It was like a stream running through a meadow. The very next year, without warning, that natural setting was destroyed. Machinery was brought in, and the stream was trenched out to become a, a three-foot deep channel. A large rock bridge was constructed to replace a small piece of cement that was once served as a, a footbridge across the creek. During the next three years, things got worse when the Landscape Committee decided to plant willow cuttings and other things along the dry dirt banks in a, an attempt to uh, correct the new erosion problem. Many who purchased homes along the creek did so because of the water views. We all know how rare it is to have a stream around your property here in California. Some of you might enjoy water views over a golf course, also pretty. Many of us lost those water views when the stream bed was lowered by three feet. The willow plantings of 2014 are now 10 feet tall and form a hedge along the creek, blocking views even further. Willows are water hogs and inappropriate for the shallow creek here in the village. They have enormous root systems, which have spread across the water and created a swamp atmosphere with pockets of stagnant water. For years, we've been told by the Landscape Department that these willows are native and therefore cannot be removed. I looked up some definitions. A native plant is one that occurred naturally and has existed for many, many years in an area. A non-native plant is one that was introduced by man. The willows in our Willow Creek Park, Aliso Creek Park, are non-native. An invasive plant is, number one, a species that has become a pest, which grows aggressively, spreads, and is non-native to the ecosystem under consideration. Number two, whose introduction causes economic or environmental harm to human health while well, the stagnant water will soon become a breeding ground for mosquitoes. <coughs> the willows in the creek fit all of these descriptions, and we beg you, please remove the willows from our village creek. 
Also, I was going to request that the Landscape Committee be televised, which may now be a moot point. But um, it's, the landscape comments are always at the very end of the GRF meeting, subsequently are not televised because the taping cuts off before the end of the meeting. So thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Sharon. Next up is Michael Laundry. Michael Landry, or Laundry, um, 693B, Avenida Sevilla. My wife and I have been gone for about three months, so maybe much of what I'm going to say might be redundant. I'm not sure. But I'd like to speak to the politics of uh, LWV. First, I'd like to address the fact that we here in LWV are certainly a microcosm of what goes on in the rest of the country, certainly in Washington, D.C. That being said, I'd like to ask about the fact that every new board that gets installed here tends to undo or change what the last board has accomplished, sometimes with positive and sometimes with negative results, just like in DC, right? Undo everything your predecessor has accomplished, it seems to be, seems to be the order of the day. Would it be too much to ask that there be some semblance of continuity and or consistency? I know the old adage, Consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds, and I paraphrase. But it seems that without more consistency in the governance of this experiment we call Laguna Woods Village, we may not be able to continue. Is it too much to ask that we put the bylaws as such as they are into practice once and for all? Again, consistency, car decals. One board comes up with a maximum number, the next board changes it. Arbitrary changes and HOA fees. I'm not a numbers person, and I don't understand spreadsheets. But it seems that spreadsheets and projected costs on these said spreadsheets only serve to confuse people like me and possibly obfuscate the issues of cost, overruns, and losses. Has it occurred to many of you that these boards, that, that most of us happen to be on fixed incomes at, these point, at this point? Um, my wife and I projected into the future uh, when, uh, when we moved in here. Uh, as far as the payment of our HOA fees, being quite liberal with the future rise in cost. But in the past 10 years, and I've been corrected since our fees have doubled, they have not, but they keep going up on a regular basis. We, we're 73 now. Uh, if we happen to live another 20 years, we'll be a deep doo-doo as far as these fees are concerned. Uh, on a weekly basis, I hear people having to move out of their homes because they've outlived their money. Yeah, bad planning, but we keep raising these fees and it'll get worse. You who have the power to raise uh, fees in your hand, do you feel that these people are just too stupid and should have planned better? I have a feeling that doubling and tripling of HOA fees may be contributing to those sad events. How about grandfathering something in for the, for the people who are nearing the end of their money, something to help them out? I know we have... Uh, uh, organizations here that help the, the people with uh, depleted funds. Um, I usually try to be comic relief. It's always a relief when I quit trying to be a comic. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Michael. Next up is Maxine McIntosh. Good morning. Good morning. I, I'd like to ask if um, <clears throat> we'll definitely have a chance to speak when you when 12A comes up, the pickleball resolution or the pickleball. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Um, I really appreciated the president's opening statement. That was a dynamic one. He gave himself a lot to live up to, and I'm sure he can do it. Um, <clears throat> I want to say I always enjoy the uh, general manager's report, always look forward to it. That and the VHS report, we never had those in the past, you know. We never had one in all the years I served on boards. We never had a, a, a PCM report, but VMS we have every month. Um, I, am, I, I know I'm happy that my little tiny analog TV with a picture tube in it that just is gut, gutless, just keeps running, and is small and fits nicely in the corner of my dining room, I have a choice. I can replace it 
or I can get the set-top box to continue using it. I've been given a choice. Everybody has that choice. That's wonderful. But I also believe, if I remember right, we were told at one time, the FCC wouldn't allow analog pass. I believe it's this, this year. And so the choice was taken away from us, even if we wanted to continue analog much longer. Um, I understand that uh, a couple of our leaders, I think it's the president and the first vice president of each board, they're meeting together. I, I don't know where those meetings are held, and I don't know when they're held. They never appear on the agenda. And I would like to know how I could get that information. I might like to attend once in a while. Also, I hope that all of you agree that all big money projects should only be discussed in open meetings to which everyone in the community is cheerfully invited. I hope you agree with that. And I am concerned about one comment the president made about directing information to the chairman of committees. I would hate to see this narrowed down to that. I like hearing when I speak, I like hearing comments good or bad, uh, from every member of the board who's interested in uh, speaking to what I say. You know, you have three people on this board who have a, hist a really long history. You have Jim Madsen, you have Ray Gross, and you have Richard Palmer, which adds to things. They can put things in historical perspective when it's a good idea. And uh, sometimes you have new chairmen on your committees who have very little experience. They're trying to catch up on that. So I hope that, that you didn't re, uh, re mean that as a response to members' comments. That would be a real shame to narrow it that very much. Thank you. Thank you, Maxine. Next up is Andre Torg. Oh, who? Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. My name is Andre Torg. 389Q, uh, and uh, I heard the chairman's uh, uh, opening comment, and I'm really excited about this uh, GIF um, board. Uh, chairman has stated that uh, the board he'll work for each of you, the residents, and to give what you want. I think that's what we're looking forward to, and hopefully we'll get uh, everybody satisfy all the uh, residents' needs and uh, wish list, and make sure that we are a happy family here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andre. Next up is Roberta Burke. Good morning, Roberta. Good morning, Roberta Burke, 933B. I'd like to welcome the new members, and I'd like to take the opportunity to wish you all a happy, healthy new year, and hopefully a calm and fruitful one. At any rate, um, I'm disregarding the reason that I came up here, to, came to this meeting to speak, which is about gate access. The, I did not know that um, the people that watch over our creek were going to be here speaking. And I'd like to bring you up to date, if I may, on a little incident, a little talk that I had with what I thought was um, the new head of landscape um, just last week or the week before. Uh, I, was, I live on the creek. I live at the very end. I'm the last house on the property line by Moulton, for those of you that have not been here long enough to hear me get up and complain about the gates. At any rate, um, I became very concerned. And the reason I became very concerned and, and to call him was because um, I've watched this scenery in front of me, this beautiful view, uh, for thir uh, 18 years. And I sort of have a feel for what's been going on over the years and the changes that it takes. And especially since we changed the, uh, the bridge up above, it, the creek has changed. There's no question about it. But we now have a creek bed in many places that is filled in with landscape. Instead of it being empty rocks and so forth, some of it had been because there was not a lot of rain previously. But now we have lawns growing. And because this year it was not cut in anticipation of the period of time that we would have um, birds, uh, birds nesting and so forth, they weren't allowed to cut it. And I don't even know when the last time was. And so looking out my window, I now not only had weeds that were about 20 feet tall, but when those weeds were finally cut, 
Now, after the season, when they are allowed to, in anticipation of the new rains coming, we have these trees growing. We never, ever had trees growing there. And I became concerned because they are young and they can be pulled out. The water that comes down is very, very rough. And I became concerned that it could block the gate openings when they open it for the rainy season and we could wind up with a lot of problems. Now I see they are really huge. And this gentleman I spoke to from Landscape told me a little bit annoyed that he had to wait another three years because after five years we could do what we want, blah, blah, blah. Well, in 18 years, nobody told us that we couldn't cut everything when they were low and before they became trees. So we never saw trees there. And that's really what should have happened, or we might not be in the predicament we're in now. So in thinking, after I hung up from him, that, well, if we leave him there another three years, how are you going to get heavy equipment down there to cut down these huge trees that will be huge three years from now? And I am warning everyone now that you have to take this really seriously because the land and the, and the silt that washes down whenever it rains is building the land level in the creek bed higher and higher and higher. And those trees are going to make that happen even faster because they stop the silt from washing down. And this all goes to the ocean. So we're holding back all the silt that should go to the ocean in within our community and within our gates. So I think that it, aside from all the willows that are really disgusting and should have been placed on a side where they couldn't block views from everyone, not just the people who live there, people come and walk for that kind of enjoyment and pleasure. I think it should be taken very seriously. I think a very serious look should be taken at the trees because we are going to have land way high. And I think down near that, near the bridge, where the bridge was built, a very serious look. It's all washing away around the outsides, and they put stuff in the wrong place. And it really should be taken out and moved somewhere else if we're being commanded to do so. And I don't think we are, because I've gone to some of those meetings. And I think a bunch of gray-haired old ladies going to those meetings can have a big effect. And I'd like to volunteer us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next up is James Brower. Okay, Joe, come on up. Good morning. Uh, welcome, uh, Tom and uh, new board members. Uh, really appreciate what I heard this morning about your anticipated way to run this uh, board. I think uh, it's going to be very well received. Um, my name is Joe Bergeon, 5372 1D. I am the president of the Laguna Woods Tennis Club. We are a 330 strong membership. Um, I'm here to talk about pickleball courts, but not 12A. What I would like to talk about is what would happen to the area if and when its decision is made that pickleball would move out of the court area that they're in now. Joe, when we get to that, we'll, we'll answer that question. Don't you think it's a little premature? We have a whole presentation on that particular subject that you're asking to speak on. Well, I, I don't I want to interfere. There with, might be some questions answered. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to interfere with 12A. Uh, that, that is all why. connected. That is all connected. Pickleball is pickleball. Whether it's the new courts suggested, the old courts, it's all going to be discussed, believe me. Uh, Are you talking about paddle tennis? Yes, I'm it? talking about the use of the, of the existing uh, area for paddle tennis. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't make that clear. Okay, go ahead, Joe. Um, we feel that uh, there are two options that could be used for that area. <clears throat> One is that uh, we can strike courts 9 and 10, the tennis courts 9 and 10, and let paddle tennis use them. And we can let golf take over the old pickleball area. The advantage to that is that pickleball and golf get new play areas to, to use. Problems are that the cost to let golf have that area is 50, uh, roughly $50,000. And all tennis courts, there's 10 tennis courts, are presently used uh, by the members during the morning. Courts 9 and 10, ball machines are, uh, and backboard are used. And then also, uh, 
the USTA uh, national tournament would have a problem if we lost two of the courts. I brought with me a, a, an email from the USTA uh, manager. Based on the number of entrants you have for the tournament, it may prove problematic for you to drop two courts and still have enough to provide an appealing schedule for the players. We want to make sure that our national championship hosts are in the best position to run world-class events, and a big part of that has to do with having adequate courts to schedule an appealing event. Signed, Michael Hughes, uh, manager of adult and senior competition, USTA. The second option to use uh, this area is to resurface the old uh, pickleball courts and let paddle tennis use them, uh, leave the tennis courts as is. The advantage of this is that uh, the three sports all get what they want. All tennis courts are kept in a professional uh, shape and can be used by UST uh, in their national tournaments. Disadvantages, it costs approximately $50,000 to resurface the courts and golf wouldn't get the old pickleball court area. But to be fair, one of them must consider that golf has more facilities than any other sports combined here at the village. For example, a 27-hole golf course on 200 acres of village property, an area that would hold over 1,000 tennis courts. A par three nine-hole golf course, a large driving range, 10 putting greens, a chipping area, two pro shops, a golf cart repair facility, and a $2.2 million budget that is 300 times larger than the combined budget of tennis and paddle tennis. Therefore, we believe that option two is the only fair option, which is to resurface the existing pickleball courts for paddle tennis, and leave the tennis courts as is. We hope you agree, and if you will vote that way, when and if the subject for what to do with the old pickleball courts make it to your agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Next up, James. Good morning, Jim Brower, 5463C. Uh, I'm here as with Joe to speak to the uh, use of restriping courts 9 and 10. The tennis club and its nearly 400 members strongly support the concept of providing a new surface for the existing panel tennis and pickleball courts for the use of paddle tennis facility when the pickleball club is provided with their new facility. We believe it would be a horrible and costly mistake to allow the demolition of the existing facility. The community already has an existing facility can easily and quickly be converted to use of active tennis club, paddle tennis club. The alternative of restriping courts 9 and 10 for paddle court, paddle tennis use would denigrate tennis facilities, which for years has been a source of pride of our community. It is because of the first class facilities we have been awarded the National Senior Hard Court Tennis Tournament, which could be in jeopardy because USA, USTA does not recognize restrike courts as tournament usable. I was in St. George, Utah recently where the Huntsman games are played for seniors. There was a lot of tennis players. And because the tennis players were of such a number, they had to use some restriped courts. Therefore, the USTA would not allow that to be a sanctioned event. This tournament brings many people to our community which would otherwise not have the opportunity to see all that we have to offer. The leaders of our community have protected the tennis facility from degradation because it's one of the first class assets of our community. We believe it is still worth protecting. Thank you for your time and service. And I particularly want to thank uh, Mr. Hudson and uh, Mr. Gruner for spending time with us to listen to our concerns. Uh, it really hadn't been done before in the same way, so I really, really want to thank you. Communication has been one of our concerns because it seemed like the Tennis, uh, tennis Board of Directors was uh, made aware of meetings after they'd already happened. And we would like in the future to have our, our tennis board uh, made aware of when there would be meetings that would be of importance to us. Thank you so much for your time and service. Thank you, James. 
Okay, next up is Cheryl Finnick. Good morning. Um, thank you so much for um, uh, suggesting that the board and the residents should have active listening skills. I think that goes a long way. And I also want to thank the board for putting on their objective hats, even though personal interests come into play when speakers come up on different topics. What I want to talk about is uh, paddle tennis court. Thank you, Joe, for saying a lot of things I don't need to say now. Um, but I moved in here about choices. This is the best place to have choices. I can join the hundreds of clubs. I can attend the fabulous activities that Brad just mentioned this morning. Uh, my parents had the same choice 20 years ago when they moved in. And I feel that if you take away the paddle tennis court, you take away my choice. I'm a tennis player. But the little disc in my back said, no more, honey. You know, you got to find something else. And so paddle tennis is what my choice was. Again, if you give us two courts in the tennis, we erode my choice. Because that means we got two courts and a lot of angry people we got to face every time we play there. So I'm asking you, please, not to take our paddle tennis courts away. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. OK, next up is Tony Dower. Hi, Tony Dower, 96C. I would just like to uh, thank Brad and all his friends. The new management has been very much more enthusiastic. Um, also, I've been living here since 2006. I paid about $20 a month to have a DVR. And let's see, that would be like three or $4,000. I mean, I could have bought the thing if I could have paid for it, but they still want me to pay the same stupid rent, $20 a month. So why can't we just have the payment stop after 10 years or something? Because uh, I could have bought one if I would have gone in Tebow. Also, we had horrible news today about fires in Ventura County. 300 homes have been wiped out by fires. I urge everyone, do not use your fireplace or grill or anything or throw cigarettes on the ground, because with this wind, it could be very disastrous. And how about the dog park? You could have a dog park down Moulton Avenue across from the senior center by the garden center there, and do it before the city ever gets their act together. They finally got a bid in for, what, $500,000 to move a dog park 100 yards away from the parking lot? Boy, I don't know. Finally. Uh, the billiard room. Uh, myself and other people love to play pool in the billiard room in Clubhouse 3. You have no idea how difficult it is to get billiard tables to be level. I had a table in Michigan that I bought from a bar, and I couldn't put it in my garage because the floor slipped like that. I could never get the thing to go straight. <laughs> So I just am telling you, if you move a billiard room from Clubhouse 3 to Clubhouse 1 or some other stupid place, it's going to not be uh, level unless they work on a, a lot of money for that. So just uh, please go ahead and uh, take care of that. And also, I'm sure glad you're going to build pickleball courts for less than 500000 If the person that does this thing for pickleball courts wants to charge more, Tell them, sorry, that's the limit, 500000 Thank you, Tony. Next up is Martin Rhodes. Martin Rhodes, 5369 uh, It's been a while since I've been in your seats but I understand what you go through. And I'm just hoping for a very successful year and that everybody sort of cooperates and compromises on issues that are the best, the residents' benefit is the first thing you decide. You must say, this is good for the resident, then you carry on to fulfill it not other issues, just drop the issue if it's not a resident benefit. Secondly, I uh, would request that you please consider the 
paddle tennis staying where it is. I have been a member for about seven years, and it is not a good idea to move it to the tennis courts. We need the four courts because on our in-house uh, competition, meaning by ourselves, our own club, and also the invitees, would not handle well on two courts. It just would not happen. I thank you very much, and best of luck. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. Are there anyone, any others? No, that's it. OK. Well, thank everyone for their concerns and we'll do our best to address them. Um, I think to start out, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about the creek, and I'm gonna ask Brad Hudson and the, his director of landscape to respond to that and to set a priority to deal with this uh, topic this next year. Brad? Yeah, thank you. Um Actually, Lori probably knows a little more about this, but both of us have extensive experience working with state and federal agencies on environmental issues. And in this particular case, uh, we had to get a 401 and a stream, a stream bed alteration permit as part of the construction of the bridge. And, and I think that uh, dictated uh, a lot of, of what's happened uh, since. Of course, the weather's had a lot to do with that as well, as there's been very, very little water, which will usually remove some of that vegetation in high water years, which we saw a little bit last year. So right now, uh, we have a habitat a mitigation and monitoring plan that we're following, and it, it sort of dictates uh, when and how we can do maintenance there, though I think there is some flexibility in that there are certain times of the year they just don't want you to, to mess around too much. So after hearing from many residents, when I first got here, I brought in really probably the top firm in the state and looking at these things, a, a, a DUDEC. And they are very good at negotiating. And this is a very, in terms of environmental issues, this is about as easy and simple as you can get, one would think. Um, it's not, I mean, I, I worked and put together a, uh, half a million acre habitat conservation plan in Riverside County that covered 100 species. And, and uh, it seemed like this is about as difficult, actually. And so we, we had tried to, to uh, basically buy our way out of this. Why don't we provide some habitat mitigation in another location that doesn't have a bunch of people living around it who enjoy things a little bit differently than the state agencies would like you to maintain it. And so um, we put together a plan for that, and it was going to be 50 grand uh, to offset the impacted uh, habitat uh, by the, the construction uh, and alterations that we had done there over the last couple of years. It actually goes back a little further than that. And so I recommended to the GRF board, this goes back probably, yeah, you remember Tom probably, I recommended, yeah, for 50 grand, let's just get these folks off our back. That seemed like a reasonable expense. And then we can more or less, within reason, manage that resource to our liking. Um, and that sounded good, and you guys approved that. And so we went back, and they said, well, let's make it 100. And so that was, I think, six months ago maybe. Uh, and so I think we kind of said, you know, let's put the brakes on this thing. If you say 100, is it going to be 200 next time we go back? Uh, what's, what's the reasonable amount? And how much, how much can we really do within the confines of the current arrangement? Uh, you know, not everything is black and white in, in these matters. And as someone mentioned, unless you do something really egregious, like build a dam or something, um, there's not a ton of penalty associated with the management of a, this kind of a resource. 
So we've kind of backed off a little bit from those negotiations. And I, I apologize for not keeping the community more involved, but I, I, I thought if we could just get away from these folks and take control of this resource that, that we know best, we live next to it, we're here all the time, uh, they're in and out, you know, based on projects and things that come up that we could do a better job. And uh, so we haven't, we haven't given up on that and we're kind of right now evaluating, is it 100 grand or maybe it's 75, maybe we can beat them down a little bit or, and then how much can we do on our own really right now without paying anybody anything. And so we're kind of evaluating that further and having, I think Dudek is still doing uh, a little bit of work for us on that as well. So I, uh, I, I, we have not given up. Um, we, there was a setback, I, admittedly, because I thought it was done. I asked you for the money and you proved it and then it was rejected. And so, so now I say that in a flip way, it wasn't really rejected. The price just went up 100%. So um, anyway, we're still working on that and, and uh, I, I, I would ask the community just to, to give us a wee bit more time and, and I think there's, there's a, the answer is out. The truth is out there and we need to find it. Thank you, Brad. Uh, to show some flexibility, Ray, would you like to comment? We'll take a little bit more. Uh, please agree. Okay, I have been a director on Laguna Canyon Foundation for many, many, many years. I'm still involved in it. I make sure that we pass out the information on Laguna Canyon. What people don't understand, we've talked about the fishing game has something to do with it. What is most important as a director, we were threatened at least 15 different times to start suits. What you need to consider is that a stream has to remain in a natural, normal condition. This was one of the big things. What was happening is that when changes were being made, a lot of the Laguna Canyon Foundation property was being destroyed. The state was involved in it and Laguna Canyon was involved in it. But the most important thing that people do not understand, that creek ends in Laguna Beach. There was the biggest threat in the world and it still exists. If you modify things that cause them to have big water problems, you are going to be sued tremendously high. This has been going on for years and years. So what they're trying to do is to get this thing worked out. But it has to be done the right way. Like I said, having been a director for many years, I was involved in this for many, many years. And you have to be careful with what you do. The streams are supposed to be, like I say, stayed in a normal, natural condition. When you make modifications, if it affects other people, then you have big problems. And that's where we got involved in some problems because changes were being made. A lot of the property was being destroyed. Um, I, that's about the, the, the best I can say on it, but believe me, there's a lot more involved in it. And like Brad's saying, there has to be a lot more going into it. So please give them a chance. I would just say, please have a little patience. We are gonna be working on this. Just, and please have a little patience and we will, we will do a better job of communicating and having some of you involved. So I hope that addresses your concerns for today. Concerning the creek, um, today was a little different. There was uh, some things that I necessarily didn't expect. Uh, I will go ahead and address some of the ones that I think is appropriate for me. Um, Ralph and the golf fees. Um, I can tell you, Ralph, as far as communications and as far as the whys and wherefores of the budget and why we had to raise and didn't, um, I reached out to. The golf, the, the men's golf club especially, the largest one, and their board, and we're setting up meetings. Yesterday we had a long meeting with Betty Parker, Diane Phelps, our treasurer, and spent an hour or so communicating about the process, how we do things, uh, and tried to answer a lot of their questions, which were the same as you had, Ralph. And their job is now going to go to their constituency, the golfers, and explain now to them what we've learned, what they've learned, and whys and wherefores of raising those fees. Uh, the, 
the two board members we spoke with were very open and, you know, very satisfied. We've even invited their treasurer to come to every meeting we have for the Treasury Committee, the Treasury Committee, the Finance Committee, I mean. So we will be reaching out. We are sharing. There are reasons. It's totally necessary, and I think the golfers um, will get off my back and eventually learn that we really care and we're going to do the right thing for the right reasons. Thank you. So that uh, hopefully that addresses that, Ralph. Um, the politics, Michael, the politics of the board. I, I'm not really sure what you would are asking of us. Um, unfortunately, my experience in 60-some years in the world, there's politics in lots of things. Uh, it's probably in everything. I can tell you that although we do have some personal likes and dislikes, we're not going to tolerate some member or somebody pushing something that is for their own and not the good of the community. I, I truly understand it's the good of the community. All the, you know, when, to get to GRF, you have to sit on one of the other boards and the mutuals. Okay, so you're kind of focused on that when you're serving there. When you come here, it's the whole community. Later on today, you're going to hear some things about what we're doing with the mutuals so that we're all on the same page and we're all thinking about the whole community. So, so uh, I don't know how to tell you that there'll be no politics in anything because that would be unrealistic, I think. And since I heard the word truth spoken by several members, the truth is the truth. And we will speak the truth. You've got to understand, you may not like the truth sometimes. We believe in the truth. We really do. And we will continue to work on sharing the truth with the community. Um, I want to thank Andre for his comments. I appreciate it. Appreciate his support as a director of United. Uh, and I thought that was very professional. Uh, I think the oh the uh, concerns about paddle tennis. We're doing a presentation today to you about pickleball, and at the end of that, we will address of what we think the future might hold for paddleball. Okay, we're we will address that if you'll stay here and listen. I'm not going to say it now because it's at the end of of the whole presentation and it it just but we will be we are addressing that um, there was one a concern a security concern was there not yes Which one? Please. Please. Well, I didn't want to put it on until I was doing you okay. <laughs> Mr. Billich was making mention of the fact that uh, he has not seen security in his area. We have a foot patrol, and they don't go around saying, hey, look at me, I'm here. The foot patrol does everything, for instance, for fire issues, hazards, lights, maintenance, perimeter fences, pest signs. And some of the reasons why we don't see a lot of the cars, the patrol units in the area, is because we have been given information. There is a lot going on in this place, this place, this place, and this place. So they don't make themselves known that, that easily. But that is the most important thing that we don't understand, is that we do have security. They're just not jumping up and down and saying, here I am. And in, these things are being looked into. And just for instance, um, uh, in, in, in uh, signs problems, let's just say perimeter fence problems. There was 12 issues already. There were 17 maintenance yes. issues. There were 103 yes. light issues. So we do have the security people out there checking. Thank you. Okay. Brad. I want to just hit a couple things real quick and just to follow up. 
uh, on Board Member Gross's comments. Um, there's a pretty aggressive security and compliance uh, effort going on. In, in 2015, maybe you've heard these numbers, we did about 1,700 compliance cases. When I got here, the board said, hey, this is a high priority for us. We've got to clean this up. And so in 2016, about 4,000. 1,700 in 15, 4,000. And I think we'll be above that and approaching you know, 5,000 at the end of this year. Uh, it's a very aggressive effort. All the boards are involved. Every single one of them uh, reviews these cases every time they meet. And sometimes they have special meetings to review them. So I, I just wanted you to be sure to understand this is really a very high priority. And I want to touch on, uh, member mentioned uh, GRF fees, assessments. Um, the assessments for GRF are lower this year mm -hmm. than they were in 2007. Mm -hmm. They're basically lower than almost every year in between. Ex last year was an anomaly because in 2016, <coughs> My first year here, we spent 1.8 million less than was budgeted. And we just carried that over and gave it back to the members by lowering the assessment for 2017. Um, unfortunately, I've learned how to spend money since I've been here, so we probably yeah. won't have 1.8 million to give you back this year. But there'll be something that, that could be credited for residents. I mean, we won't bust the budget. So that, that's a good thing. And then uh, lastly, I, I think, on the golf fees, I think I think really have to to address that there are some statements made that that are just incorrect, and I I, I feel compelled to to enlighten the community on on what's really going on here. These are round numbers, but uh, it cost about 3.6 million to run that golf operation. 3.6 million, um, and about 1.6 of that last year came in fees. So. If when we make the adjustments that, that are recommended, it'll basically flip that. And so the percentages will be, uh, here, let me go back to 2013. The community paid 48% of the golf, and the golfers paid 52%. Okay, that's 2013. Get up here to 2017, community 55%. Golfers, 45, a flip. And so what, with what we're proposing here, we'll take it community 42, golfers 58. Now, we don't raise golf fees every year, so probably over the next two or three, four or five years, however many, it'll, it'll stay similar, and, and then it'll get a little closer to 50-50, and then it'll flip the other way, and we'll have to come and talk again um, because do, things do go up. However, I'm confident, I'm confident with our new golf manager that you're going to see some downward pressure on some of these costs. And, and as someone mentioned, you know, staffing is a pretty, pretty big cost when it comes to running a golf course. And, and I think it's my opinion and his as well that the golf course is overstaffed and has been for years and, and primarily excessive, you know, part-time workers. And so we're going to be be making some reductions in that area and others uh, to try to keep some downward pressure on these fees uh, so we don't have to take a, a peek at them uh, too often. So that's where we're at. I think it's important to share that um, uh, we're really, I think long term, there was a concept uh, that golfers should pay 65% of the course and, and res, the other res, non-golfing residents or residents in total 35%. And so that, that sort of has been a range. We're not really quite there. The community is paying more than 35%. And, and so uh, it is a wonderful asset for the village and I think it contributes greatly to the value of these manors, whether you're a golfer or not. Um, this would be an entirely different place without that wonderful amenity. So I think we all understand that. And I, you know, I, I wanted to share both sides of that. I hope, I hope Maxine, you're understanding that it's not ironclad that only the chair can speak. If that's what you took under certain circumstances, what I'm trying to do is to increase efficiency 
and you know work on the whole agenda, not just one, and have 15 people give their opinion. There is a there is a middle ground here that we will see. Ray uh, spoke, and we will continue to do that when it's necessary. But for the most part, I would like the chairs to address the community's concerns in that particular arena. Does that make sense? Thank you. Uh, Beth? I'd just like to speak to uh, Chris Collins talking about the foundation. This time of year, the foundation is able to do um, some work with South County to help some of our most needy residents to have a wonderful holiday meal and, and a gift. Another thing that Chris mentioned that if you are in, have an emergency need uh, and you can go to social services and talk to them about possibly if you are a person who needs a medical alert or an, uh, that you know that you may be needing an ambulance, you will want to go to social services and have them interview them. And if it's a possibility, um, then the foundation will consider your request. That's the first thing I wanted to say. Then I wanted to say, um, uh, Michael Landry, good point, you know. <laughs> One board does something, the next board undoes it. Um, hopefully, we have consistency on this board of people who have been on this board for the past few years, and people who are new to the board have been on other boards and can look at it and say, yeah, we need to keep up the consistency and the direction that we're looking um, and the vision of, of, um, of this particular board hopefully is a good match for the vision of the previous board, so it should work out. Thank you. Any other director come? Yes, Diane. Uh, let's see. First, um, Ralph had mentioned uh, what the 100,000 rounds is. I believe it's 18 holes. Uh, and also, Michael uh, said that we should stop raising the HOA fees because people are on a fixed income, but that we should also stop raising the other fees. Well, that's our dilemma. When the costs go up, we have to figure out how we're going to get the money to pay for it. And so. Um, what we've been trying to do is to keep the HOA fees as low as we can and not raise them too much because if you are on a fixed income and your HOA fee goes up, you have no choice but to pay it. As opposed to the other fees, you can golf a little less, you can share the room with more people, you can golf nine holes instead of 18, whatever. Uh, and so that's why we've, you know, we balance the two, but, but that is why you see some fees going up. Um, and... <clears throat> the same with uh, what Tony said about the cable boxes and that maybe we would eventually could stop charging people for the boxes. Know that what we're doing, again, that's just offsetting the cost of our cable programming. And so if you don't pay it for it by renting a box, then you're going to pay for it in HOA fees. Um, it's not that we're making money on things and, um, th you know, that's not our intention. That that's not what we're doing. Uh, and the only other thing I thought is perhaps with the creek is you might want to think about uh, sort of appointing someone as a point man on that since we don't have a landscape committee at the moment. That was it. Good suggestion. We'll talk about it. Thank you. Well, given that, I hope we've answered some questions. And I hope you feel like we're going to work for you, as I said earlier. All the comments about residents first, believe me. We're residents too, okay? And we, we do believe in that, and we're going to work as hard as we can during this next year with anybody we need to work with to get things done appropriately. Thank you. Okay. Item 11, consent calendar. Uh, we took 11A out, didn't we? Yes, 11B. Uh, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve pool for maintenance. Discussion? No discussion. All in favor? Unanimous. Uh, I kind of did that. I should have done both. That's right. Uh, I should have done both. I, yes. I apologize. Yes. Uh, we'll go ahead and go to C. I should have done the whole thing, but. There's a resolution on C. Yes, there's a resolution on C, so I'll entertain a motion 
to suspend pool and fitness guest fees. We have a resolution. Will the secretary read it, please? Yeah. Resolution 9017-XX, suspension of pool and fitness guest fees. Whereas in April 2017, the Community Activities Committee approved a pilot program to temporarily suspend pool and fitness center guest fees. And whereas after one season, the usage at the pool or fitness center did not yeah. have an increase as a result of suspended guest fees, now, therefore, be it resolved, December 5th, 2017, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby temporarily suspends pool and fitness center guest fees from May through August of 2018, and res resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. I so move. Second. Discussion? All of, oh, no, I, I, I don't really like this resolution. I think it's misleading. Um, this summer, when uh, the pool was open, we had an influx of many more grandchildren than we had in the past. Um, several of our residents were experiencing major health problems with infections and respiratory problems because the pools were not, we couldn't maintain the pools well enough, and uh, which is, of course, an expense to us. And I, hearing residents speak, they talk about um, controlling fees and moderating um, our behavior so that residents are who comes first. And, and truthfully, I think that you are more important to us than your grandchildren or your friends. And I, I think that we have to keep that in mind whenever we make a decision. And I think this is contrary to that. So I do not support this. Beth? In the discussion in Community Activities Committee, putting this forth, it's about safety reasons more than anything, really, because people will bring their grandchildren to the pool when it's the pool time if their grandchildren are visiting. So it's not really that, it's not really the money, it's the, the lifeguard having to check and make sure you're paying your money, you're checked in, that activity. And we really uh, looked at it and said, we really don't make that much money charging for the guest fees in the summertime. We'd like to do this, continue this project through August to see if it's worthwhile, if we make enough money to make it worthwhile to have the lifeguards overseeing and making sure everyone pays, or if we're better off, people are going to bring their grandchildren no matter what, and then if they don't pay, then we don't have to be monitoring the payment and taking our eyes off the pool. That's the biggest thing, a lifeguard taking their eyes off the pool. Thank you. Annette. Having uh, grandchildren and been at the pool uh, quite a bit this year, and I was one on CAC who voted against suspending the fees, uh, or actually I discussed it, but then when everybody voted, I voted with them. Um, what I wanted to say about it was there are a lot of children at the pool, and we're talking about less than $5,000 in terms of income, and these lifeguards who have to watch these large pools should keep their eye on the water at all times. They should not have, this is a real laborious system that's set up. You have to have cash for them. They gotta go back to the little house and get the cash. They have to sign in the kids and sign in, you know, sign in yourself. It just takes up way too much time. And uh, yeah, I totally support the fact that we waive these. Thank you. Brad? Yeah, I just wanted to, to remind the board and the community that we contracted out lifeguard services this year. So these are no longer our employees. And so the the process of collecting and handling all this cash uh, by folks who we haven't vetted, that aren't our employees, is just in one more factor that we considered in all this. With respect to the fitness centers, I think we collected all of like $700 last year. So you can imagine how much money it took to take 20 bucks or a week or something, uh, 
put it in an envelope, deposit it, account for it, audit it. It just doesn't make any sense to charge for, for something that has that little usage. Um, I'll also, we have, uh, our director of recreation has probably more years of experience in the pools than anyone in this room. So I'd like, uh, Brian Gruner, do you have any comment about the issue of collecting money or? Well, first off, good morning. Um, yeah, so it's the, obviously the lifeguard's main responsibility is to watch the pool, maintain, um, mm -hmm the safety aspect as much as possible there. Uh, it, for them to collect money um, is not something that we would encourage them to do to really do because it's taken away from watching the pool. And unfortunately, drownings happen um, very, very quickly within a matter of seconds. Um, when a person goes under, then they're pretty much gone. And it's really hard to you know detect that if you're not paying close attention to it. So um, it would be our recommendation not to have that fee. OK, thank you, Brian. Yes. This won't go on. Sure. Uh, I was a lifeguard for seven years in New Orleans. And like he says, it only takes a split second. You have no idea how many people I had to go and do and, and take out of the water. And with that under consideration, why waste your time? It, it's a safety factor. It's a safety factor. Thank you. Thank you. No further. Yeah, I just have one question. Um, when the children come to the pool, are they supposed to be accompanied by adults? Sure. Yes. And so that the adults are watching their own kids. Mm -hmm. Because what's the point of, you know, I, I'm not expecting a big crowd of kids coming in because it doesn't cost anything. But the fact remains, if the adults are there, then it's going to take a lot less pressure off the lifeguards so they can concentrate on safety. Un unfortunately, the parent, it's generally grandparents, maybe. And I don't know about you, but to ask a 75, 80 year old person to jump in uh, after their grandchild and do CPR is probably unrealistic, in my opinion. I'm not asking for that. I'm just asking to to, to control the kids. Oh yes, yeah. That's what I'm yes. pointing at. I totally agree with you. Yes. Tom, I'm sorry to make a second comment, but no one says the lifeguard has to control has to manage the money. Every clubhouse has a clubhouse manager and staff. So all you need is to go to the clubhouse, get a token like you do in Bridge when you want to shoot some balls, and it's taken care of. Thank you, ladies. We agree. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion of the board? Vote on the resolution. President Circle, we have one request to oh, speak on this I item. I didn't know that. Thank you. This is consent. Andre? We don't know. We should have moved them off and talked. Talk yeah, That's right. Uh, 389Q, Andre Torn. Uh, thanks friend. for the opportunity to speak on this one. I totally agree that the lifeguard's responsibility is for the safety, not for the administration, uh, administrative uh, responsibility. However, there are uh, presidences in other clubs that they it's volunteer system that they need to pay the money and make sure that they control. So that will discourage some people that are not authorized just walk in there. Okay, that's the biggest concern that we have. Uh, occasionally, we do have uh, homeless people that go into the places that uh, taking showers, that kind of thing. So we want to discourage those people. Uh, so what I'm suggesting is, can we have a, maybe a token system or something like that, that they have the grandparents, when they bring children, they have to deposit some money. So we don't have people just say, okay, it's open uh, uh, pool, now we bring five you know, kids over. And that will be very difficult for the, uh, even the grandparents to control, and that tax the uh, uh, lifeguards' uh, responsibility. So maybe a volunteer system. Uh, that they uh, suggest is, uh, works well with uh, other clubs. So maybe it can work with the pool system. Thank you. Thank you. OK, no further discussion. Uh, voting on the resolution. Well, we already voted on one side. OK. Yeah, it was my fault. But we'll go ahead and vote on the resolution. All in favor? All opposed? One. 
passes. Okay. Now, we also have, uh, what is it, 12A, did we not move it, or 11A, we moved down to 12C? 12C, that's is correct. Is that correct? That's correct, we now are at 12A. 12A, kickable. Yeah. Uh, Clubhouse 7 Main Lodge uh, wood floor replacement, entertain a motion to approve that? Yes. Right, is 12A, 12 12A. 11? 12C. That is <laughs> Okay, we're going to 12A first. I'm sorry, I was a little confused. Presentation on pickleball project process. Okay. Can you do 11C. 11C has been moved. 11C, I thought was moved. You can do 11C. Uh, 11A was moved to 12C. Just did 11C. And, and will be heard um, after 12B. 12B. We're on 12. 12A is the presentation on pickleball project process and budget. Correct. Okay, here we go. Okay, yes. 12, 12A. I'm going to uh, ask that we rescind the pickleball contract and prepare amended documents for bidding and set corporation a corporate corporate members meeting for January 30th, 2018 at 9:30 in the boardroom for a presentation for approval. Um, our community activities committee has been discussing the need for pickleball project for over five years. The CAC Beth Perrick will now give you some history and where we are now with regards to the project. Beth? Thank you, Tom. If you'd like to follow along with what I'm saying, please turn to agenda item 12A, page 2, and you can follow along with what I'm reading. On November 7, 2017, the GRF board awarded the pickleball project to B. Foster for an amount not to exceed $498,955. Since that time, Third and United Mutuals have asked GRF to call a corporate members meeting to review the way the process was handled. Specifically, staff has received comments such as the following. What items were deleted from the original plan and why? The answer, the following items were deleted from the plans. Card readers, electrical meter, stub boxes, all wiring, transformer concrete slab, Edison transformer, etc. The reason for scope revisions was to bring the project below $500,000. Question, was the bidding done correctly? Yes. The project was actually bid four times, which is more than typical. The project was advertised in the Dodge Green Sheet, and those interested were invited to a pre-bid meeting. A request for proposal was sent out to all who had expressed interest, plus four sports court subcontractors. When final plans were received, they were distributed to seven contractors. Only two contractors responded, both with amounts over $500,000. Staff revised the scope and performed value engineering and sent the fourth request for estimates to three contractors. Two bids were received, only one below $500,000. What was the lowest bidder negotiated with to bring the project within budget? Answer, staff was told by the higher bidder, who had already reduced the project at least 10%, that the amount was their final bid. It is customary to work with the lowest bidder and to remove portions of the scope to bring the project within budget. Question. Why doesn't the contract include a 10% contingency? Answer, 
No extra funds were available in the appropriation for a contingency. Staff had surveyed and studied the property for more than seven years and had a comfort level. Further value engineering could have yielded a contingency if needed. If you will check, you can check on attachment one on page four, which itemizes the process that the staff went through to bid the project, including construction bid processes. So you can look at that and your leisure. Now we're going to talk about what, what's happening right now. Where are we now? So during the agenda prep meeting for this December meeting, the GRF board directed staff to prepare a report rescinding the pickleball contract. The board expressed interest in listening to the concerns of the other mutual boards and to the community. To kick off the communication, the board presidents and first vice presidents met to discuss regular monthly meetings, calling them president's meetings, better communication between boards and the community, and a definition of GRF projects that trigger a vote of the corporate members as required by GRF bylaws. So see this movement toward being more transparent, more communication reaching out. Subject to approval today, the staff will review the previous pickleball plans before value engineering, refine the scope of the work, develop a budget, and consult with legal counsel regarding the amended bid package. The bid package will then be forwarded to finance, MNC, and the CAC committees for review, and then it will go to the GRF board prior to going to the corporate members' vote. Thank you. And now, where do we want to go from here? Tom. For the president's meetings in December and January, a standing agenda item, pickleball project update, will be included for discussion. The corporate members' meeting will be set again for January 30th at 9.30 here in the boardroom to consider the amended pickleball project. GRF expressed the need to be cost conscious and believes that we are going back to the original plan. There will be little need for any revisions or no need for additional city approvals other than building permits. To avoid a similar issue in the future, Legal counsels will work together to achieve clarity and agreement concerning procedures, definitions, and scope of GRF facilities versus building projects that would trigger a vote of the corporate members. Finally, GRF has expressed interest in reviewing the needs of paddleball in the near future and appreciates input already received from the clubs and will seek even more input concerning paddleball and what we do with paddleball in the future, in the very near future. I think I can safely say that all of us up here on the diocese have been asked why the project was handled the way it was. In March 2017 at the MNC committee meeting, staff demonstrated the need of the project. Namely, the existing facility is completely inadequate and inappropriate for our commu community. So while fair argument can be made regarding community priorities and finances, on January 31st, 2017, the GRF board and their strategic planning session identified Pickleball as the top priority of 17 projects on our project log. With that, I'm going to entertain a motion to one, rescind the existing pickleball court construction contract with B. Foster. Two, augment the pickleball capital project funding from 250,000 from reserves. Direct staff to revisit original plan, the original plan prior to removal of on the items to come within, to come under the 500,000 budget, and prepare amended scope and construction plans not to exceed 750,000. 
refer to the amended number four, excuse me, number four. <clears throat> refer the amended scope and construction plan, again, to finance, MNC, community activities, for review and recommendation back to this board. Number five, call a corporate meeting for G January 30th, 2018 in this room. And number six, continue to work with mutual presidents and legal counsels to better fa define facilities and structures and procedures moving forward. Can I? Okay. I move we accept staff's recommendations for these six steps forward. I second the motion. Discussion? With no, with no discussion? <coughs> I have discussion. OK. <laughs> I just would like to make sure that they have card readers included in the bid. That's all. OK. okay. All, in all in favor? Did you have a comment, Richard? Yes, I did. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Yes, sir. Uh, I lost my train of thought. Uh, I thought that the corporate meeting was canceled. It has been. It's rescheduled for January 30th, sir. It's rescheduled. Okay, so it's rescheduled. It's rescheduled. Okay. Okay. I, I just wanted to share that upon United's request that we have the meeting the meeting has to be scheduled between 10 and 90 yeah. days from the request which your dates well within kind of in the middle uh, of that time but it has to be noticed i believe within 15 days somebody could correct me mm -hmm. so tomorrow so the notice will need to go out very quickly like today or tomorrow it's being handled okay and then i have a question Okay. The the amount the seven hundred fifty thousand dollar amount is are we setting a cap and it's not to exceed that it's amount? It's not to exceed that. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Frazier. Okay. I don't normally uh, criticize the uh, staff reports, but in this situation, I believe that the uh, statement that it says the existing site is totally inadequate for mm -hmm. what is contemplated for pickleball and the new courts will be 50% larger. Actually, if we go back to 2014, 2015, there was work that had the existing courts to be realigned, realigned on the existing pad to get eight courts. Now, what you're gonna build for 750,000 <coughs> is six courts. So I disagree with that. For 16,000, you know, we got 16,000 feet available there. And by realigning it and we can resurface it, we had estimates that that could all be done for less than $400,000. Half the amount of what we're talking about. Keeping the facility at the existing site will significantly intrude upon other uses, was the statement in the report. What other uses? A golf academy? I'm hearing people talk about, well, we can have a golf academy. I would question whether this is appropriate for our community. When the residents are already supporting golf operations at $1.6 million a year, as this year, raised on the greens fees at $16 per manor, per, or, or $16 per round. Additionally, as many of you know, I have played and managed golf tournaments throughout the country. Most golf courses, both private and daily fee courses, do not have the golf practice and training facilities which already exist within this community. And Tom, all you have to do is go down to Mission Viejo Country Club. I disagree. Okay, you can go to right across the street here, Alyssa Viejo Country Club. They do not have any practice facilities over there. Okay. So let's be thankful for what we have and improve what already exists and let's not go for more. Parking more, the statement in the report says, parking more remote and difficult for some of our residents to walk down the hill uh, at the park because the parking at gate 12 is limited. 
If a person cannot walk, they surely will have difficulty playing paddle tennis and pickleball. <laughs> okay, so relative to the limited parking, I doubt if you could find anyone to say parking is limited at gate 12 except on Friday and Saturday evenings when the dance clubs uh, are having a, an activity in Clubhouse 2. Besides, the next item on your agenda is to remove the shuffleboard facility and replace it with a park, which frees up nine parking spaces and the additional course from going from four to seven courts or eight courts is adding four and a half parking spaces. And that can be accommodated with the city. And finally, the and a statement is that the village demographics are changing to younger residents. I've lived in this community since 1994. The median age when I moved in was 78 years. Now, almost 24 years later, the median age is still reported at 78 years. Every year, we sell between 600 and 1,100 manors. The oldest move out, one way or another, okay, <laughs> and the younger move in. But the age distribution remains roughly the same. Therefore, our demographics are not changing, and I doubt whether the newcomers are any more active than those of us who moved in here 24 years ago, and, and, and many will continue work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you I for appreciate your all the work you do, having been on boards for nine years. But please do not respond to a want rather than serving our needs, which is the maintenance of this community. Thank you for your opinion, Kathy. President Mr. Palmer. Yes, <clears throat> we also got to consider uh, using the old uh, pickleball courts in this evaluation. If it costs a lot less money, that's. It's my understanding the, that what Catherine's talking about, that wasn't a bid. We're actually looking at bids. We also thought this wasn't going to cost us as much. Those are just estimates. Um, I would also question that, I mean, I remember years ago seeing designs of, of courts built, but there were retaining walls that were needed. And again, it, it, what it encroached on was the existing um, cart path. <clears throat> then, um, that doesn't answer my question. Are you going to consider reusing the existing courts? Of course we are moving in the next. We will consider the whole, you know, well, like I said, I, as I told the community, when we go to paddle ball, we'll consider whatever we need to consider to make an appropriate facility for paddle ball. But what and about pickleball? Pickleball would then be across the street, and they would have an appropriate place to play. So you're not going to... Uh, uh, we don't know yet, Richard. That decision has not been made. Well, the move, point is, the is it could be considered. Pickleball, yes, that's, that's been made. Okay? No, we straight there. Paddleball, in connection to tennis or whatever we do with it, whether we leave it, whether we put it on the... is to be determined. That this does not just say what we'll do for paddleball. No, I'm talking about pickleball now. Yeah. Are you going to evaluate again the existing site or not? It has been done numerous times. Right. We've studied this in mm -hmm. CAC for five years. This is where we're going. We're moving. Yes. It has been it has been reviewed, it's been looked at, we've got recommendations. It, she's been dealing with it for fi about five years. This is now what we have decided to do. I'm sorry, um, may I uh, m make a comment? I don't know if I'm out of place by doing Go so. Go ahead. Um, the movement of pickleball across the street is certainly a good idea in my mind. They deserve more courts. But uh, going to a $750,000 probably is also a good idea. However, the paddle tennis problem. There are several people who question this being clear. Okay. The paddle tennis problem 
is is combined with the pickleball mission because paddle tennis and pickleball are now one group of people sharing the courts. To segregate paddle tennis and leave pick, uh, to segregate pickleball and leave paddle tennis as an open question, not funding anything for them at this time, but giving seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars to solve the pickleball end of it. And leaving paddle tennis for some other time, I think, is a mistake. I don't know why we just don't make this one project and say, we have to give paddle tennis the due that they deserve and give pickleball the due they deserve. And if that's a million dollars, then make it a million dollar project. And let's get it out of the way so we don't meet here another time a year. Joe, I, I appreciate your input. I appreciate your opinion. It's just not shared by this board. We, we believe, I believe I can better serve paddleball and pickleball by doing it in this manner. Yeah. Yes, yep. Mr. Matson. We, we, we do have comments here that members have filled out cards and we want to hear from them. Okay, the next speaker is Joe Fitzsum. Mr. President, yes, sir. may I pass this information out? I suppose. Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I've spent a few hundred hours what is studying this situation. What is it? And I won't presume really to happy. make this Joe Fitzgerald 405D. I won't presume to make your decisions for you, but I'm giving you a booklet with options as to what you can look at. Uh, one of the things I read across the presentation is the per current courts were too small. The reality is you spend $750,000 to build a smaller facility. The current facility has documented proof in there that it'll hold eight pickleball courts. I have folks for a, a patio we can deal off with. For half of what you're doing, we can have eight pickleball courts, have them lighted, have paddle tests maintained what they do right now. I know if you talk to Mr. Circle, we're at a, a meeting together, he said I have 24 members. We're now 80 paid members next year. There's 90 some members who have signed up. I suspect we'll be at 125 members where we used to be before we shared the pickleball. Would you slow down? Okay. Okay, I, I don't want to take offense to what your man oh, I understand. Is. I have played 12 different sports here, golf, tennis, for over 50 years. You cannot make legitimate judgments without all the truthful facts. A Greek philosopher said 2,500 years ago, wait for the wisest of all counselors, time. A meeting about paddle tennis was hidden from paddle tennis. The story of the city rules causing parking problems and courts had to be taken out, which was published in the paper, was not accurate. The information the paddle tennis courts could not fit on the same size as the pickleball court was not accurate. You have documented, documented proof there from several companies. The impression That's was left that the 80 normal. member and rapidly growing paddle yeah, tennis club would be moved to tennis because pickleball was so busy. By your own numbers published in the paper, if you add paddle tennis and pickleball outdoor together, yeah. tennis is 300% larger. Why would we go to tennis? I've studied with experts in and out of California. The conclusion, the present paddle tennis courts can be used for eight pickleball courts paddle and paddle tennis courts. Pickle with light and gets 2,220% more court time than the six courts proposed. We will have lighting, a new 1,600 square foot patio, new surface guaranteed for 15 years, a surface that can last up to 30 years, interior fencing, water, electric, two extra courts, and all can be used at night at a cost of half of what you're projecting. I can show how the real cost of moving pickleball is closer to $2 million. First of all, you're talking about $750,000. Then you lose the land asset it takes. Then you have to take out the pickleball courts. Then you're going to repurpose it because that was the plan for all of this. The reality of this, it's a $2 million cost to the community to do that. The reality is also, open your mind, open your heart, and think of the residents, and don't open our wallets to waste money. Winston Churchill said, Truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it, ignorance may deride it, but in the end, there it is. Please read this. This proves what we put in a document today that the new court system is 50% bigger than the one that exists. Why are you building six courts when you can put eight where we are at? And I have had companies come out and look at it. I've had a concrete company here. I know the facts are saying. I have spent hundreds of hours on this. Thanks, Joe. Your time is up. Okay. Sit down, please. Please be quiet. Thank you. Thank the you for your comment. Speaker is Susan Frank. I don't like
Thank you. Good Zimmer. morning, Suzanne Frank, 227B. I'm a tennis player and a paddleball tennis player. I cannot understand why you want to rip out the paddle tennis courts. I'm happy that pickleball is going to be getting new courts. I think they deserve it. Here is an amenity that already exists and can be fixed. So it makes no sense to me to have to rip it out, and the rumor is, hand it over to golf. Golf has plenty. And you don't need a new chipping area if that was what the purpose was. You have one already behind the tennis courts. To take two tennis courts and restripe them for uh, paddle tennis is ridiculous. We would lose a very prestigious tournament we have in the spring, which brings 132 players here from all over the United States. Why would you want to do that? We're not going to get that tournament if you restripe those courts. Those tennis courts are used every morning, all 10 of them. And the two you want have the ball machine on there. The ball machine usage is from 11 o'clock on. So when are the paddle tennis players going to get to play? Point of order. Uh, paddle tennis is not the topic. Pickleball is. And we will entertain paddle tennis well, shortly. Um, okay. I understand you need to put it in, but we need to get on with this motion. Well, yes. I'm just saying, because you're going to get pickleball, just don't rip out an amenity gotcha. that exists. Gotcha. Thank you very much, and thank you for your service. Thank you. OK, the next speaker is Maxine McIntosh. <coughs> she left. OK, let's move on then to Joan Brown. Joan Brown, 5587A. Um, I'm probably the only one in the room who's been in, involved in this. Jim Brower. Except for Jim Brower. Since this started in 20, I, I got involved in 2011, 2012. Um, they have studied the, an architectural firm came in and evaluated keeping the courts, expanding them on, on the site they're in, and found they'd have to dig into the hill, build retaining walls, redo the cart path. And that was the basis for recommending that it go across the street on a vacant <clears throat> plot of land. Since we began this, when, when we began this project, I guess I'm imploring, imploring you to, to keep this moving. When we started in 2012, there were two, era, two places that had pickleball courts in the area, Tustin and Crown Valley. Since then, both of those courts have been redone because pickleball has grown so much. Also, just in this area, since we began this, Costa Mesa, San Juan Capistrano, Laguna Niguel, Laguna Hills, Lake Forest, Newport Coast, Newport Beach, Mission Viejo, and Ladera Ranch have all built pickleball courts, and we are still here talking about this project. That's all I have. Thank you, Joan. <laughs> OK, the next up is Maxine, Maxine. McIntosh. Maxine. Of course, I'm sorry that the pickleball players didn't have a newly renovated area a year and a half ago, which they could have at that time in the present location. Like, <clears throat> I like the pickleball people to have decent courts. I want you to play as much as I like people to get off that waiting list for garden centers, definitely. What I'm concerned about is the money we spend. The money we all pay to GRF through assessments of course, should be spent on very reasonable needs of a sport. I feel our money should not be spent to make the dreams of a specific club come true. In this room and privately outside, I've heard four regular pickleball players say, we don't need more courts. Everybody likes to play at the same time. so. That it would be nice to have more courts, but we don't actually need more. And that's not paddle tennis, that's just pickleball. With the dream plan described, maintenance costs would, would immediately jump 
All of us would have to pay for that as well in our assessments. Everything decided on here for spending comes from our assessments and from the uh, facility fee that is charged when people buy in. This is what was wrong with the 2013-14 Recreation Master Plan. It was designed to make the costly dreams of a few come true. And most of the people weren't even involved, weren't asking for those costly dreams. They just wanted good services. I do not want to be forced to pay a share of this elaborate plan. A plan, yes, but not this elaborate one. I don't know if it includes what I understood we were told earlier, that the city would demand that you tear down the old pickleball courts before you can start construction across the street. No. So has that been changed? That was never, that was never the case. Okay. That was That's announced. rumor versus no. truth. Months ago. Okay. Um, should GRF reconsider a beautiful and reasonably priced renovation in place for Catherine mentioned under 400000 I thought the original renovation was estimated at 200000 Should GRF proceed with an elaborate, unnecessarily costly relocation plan for probably 750000 or more? Those are the two points. Do a beautiful job where they're located now, give them more courts, or do the costly, elaborate plan you're considering at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Maxine. Our last speaker on this item is Cheryl Finnick. Uh, 2350C. Uh, um, again, on the topic, I'm, I'm really confused. I totally appreciate that, um, uh, been, as Tom mentioned, that there's been a long time discussion about the pickle courts. And then now we're hearing another aspect of it. Is it a done deal? I, I don't understand that. I don't expect a direct conversation with me. Um, if it's just, we've done all this homework. I've been on homeowner social boards in the past. So I get you do the homework, and then we come up, and we, we're, we're upset with you all, and we want you to do it a different way, and you put all your time and energy into it. But there's also an aspect of reconsideration if facts and money and all the influences work together. So what I'm asking you is, considering all the energy you put into it, perhaps a reconsideration might, might be OK at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Th that includes member comments. OK. Any other discussion? Mr. Palmer? Yeah, I, I still like to consider Reusing the existing courts. I, I, when I first got on this board four, about four years ago, they were talking about building a new clubhouse. They spent a million dollars on architectural fees. What did we do? We canceled the project. So even though we spent, uh, yeah. I don't know how much we spent on, how much was spent? 100 dollars. 100 grand. Not a million. I mean, I, I just want to take a look at reusing it. I don't think we, we ever have it. Brad. Yeah, I, again, that is really, uh, I know we've talked about this before. We have studied the existing site. We have oh. done, hired geotechnical engineers to bore holes and to look at it and to analyze it. And everybody comes up with the same opinion. That was constructed very poorly even at the time it was constructed. It is on the move. Yes. That's why it's cracked. Um, that if you were going to build something there, and it's certainly a reasonable place to build something like this, if that was your choice, you would rip that out, excavate and recompact the soil there, and basically build what you're building here. It, it's same, same. Um, the site you're relocating it to is challenging from a geotechnical perspective for different reasons. It's just got a lot of slope to it, and so much like this one. But it, it, uh, it also needs some work. So I can't, I can't visualize a situation where rebuilding that, where it's at, is any cheaper than what's before you That's for that very reason. Now, is there a cheaper solution? Yes, there's a very cheap solution, but it's very short term. And that would be to, to get some of this acrylic material 
that floats over the top of that and to put it on there. And, and, and that would last you for a while uh, until that moves sufficiently where it wouldn't work anymore. And then, um, and then I think that uh, we're thinking that that cost, and Joe's got 50 here. We've bid it to a couple of people, and it seems like it was closer to 100 or uh, certainly a lot more than what he's got here. Um, mm -hmm. um, and we may be specking different material too, so that, that could be the case. Um, okay, so anyway, so, so would you want to spend 100 on something um, that may only have a five year lifespan? You know, I, I don't know, that, that's a decision that you would have to make. I have to say, and I've been, you know my opinion privately, and I, I think it's time I make it publicly, is the best solution here that you should do is to move all of this over to the new site and spend the money we told you it would cost to do that. Um, and if you can't do that now, then why not resurface that one over there now and save the money until you can do it right. And that cost of that, that was, I believe, the eight pickle and the two paddle with restrooms and running water, drinking fountains, outdoor area is about 1.2 million to do pickle, paddle, and have a multi-use facility where you could have outdoor dances, you could do things, you know, would have a gathering area, be more of a, a real facility, that's what that would cost. Um, so those are all the three things, actually four things that we've studied. Put it all in one place, include restrooms, include lights, include the things just like tennis has, Mm -hmm. Right, just like tennis, um, and that's about 1.2 million. Which I built a number of these, so I, I think that's about what they cost. Um, this site is a little trickier because it's sloped, so there's retaining walls and grading that you might not have on a completely flat site. You, we've studied. So that's one option. We've studied this option that that was before you at your last meeting. That's two options. We've studied it at the existing court, right? That's three options. We actually studied it around the tennis court. That was an older option that, that, was, that goes back a ways. That's four options, and we've studied putting the acrylic over the existing courts, so that's your fifth option. So it's not like folks have been sitting on their hands here not looking at all the options out there. And so what I don't like about what you approved at your last meeting is it takes a pretty good piece of dirt Though it's sloped and it has some work and it doesn't use it very efficiently um, because you're avoiding the cost of doing the retaining walls, um, you don't get to use the site in a, in a manner that it, a real estate of that cost and expense deserves to be used. You're not respecting the property the way, and I have a development background, so I, I would want to maximize the yield off of a given piece of land. And that would likely include asking the city for, for a variance from this silly 50-foot setback on, on Molten, which probably makes sense on a flat ground, but this site is way above the road there. It doesn't matter if it's on the edge or, or 50 feet back. You can't see what's there anyway. It's a, it's a hill. Um, so the, again, we've looked at this. We've thought about it. Yep. And all that information is before you. And, and now it's, it's your policy board's choice as to, to where we should head. And, and of course, at your suggestion, the corporate members as well. And, and that was my point. My point is this has been studied. The original, the original problem is we've had people fall and bust their head open. We're going to get lawsuits. Okay? It needs to go. We have studied it. We've had, they've hired people to look at it. You can either dismiss what they have found and go find your own and then come before us and say, no, they're wrong. I'm saying, in my opinion, we've studied it. This is the best move we can make for the community. Not for me, for the community. I'll call it for the vote. May I speak or no? Uh, no, no, we're no. done. We have a motion before the board. We need to vote. I know we don't need to vote, but I just want to say. Okay. 
Beth? So I have a question for Brad. So we vote this and we say, yes, we want to fund this project now. Is there uh, a possibility that in looking at it, because our next thing is to look at paddle, so could we be looking at it and we could say, wait a minute, let's take this amount of money and add to it to get to the 1.2 million and and end up with the whole thing? Or we're, we do this and this is what we do and then we come up with a new plan for paddle separate, which is what I, we I think those are your, those are your two choices and the direction right now is look to look to do this one to separate them and then one and then the other okay. um, and there are options to do that motion before the board all in favor raise your right hand opposed passes motion passes pending pending our Approval by the corporate members on January 30th. Thank you. Okay. Please, we're trying to, please, please, please. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We are now on, huh? 12B. Item 12B on the agenda. Ah, entertain a motion uh, to approve services of a design consultant to implement the interim passive park development at Clubhouse 2. Do we have a motion? I so move. Second. Any discussion? I think I you, you need to clarify. I think you need to clarify what is meant by passive park. Okay, I, I can do that. Okay. Um, first of all, I did want to want to share. Wait, let's get the audience call. Oh, okay. Can we please clear the room, please? We'd like to conduct business. Thank you, sir. Bye. This was. Um, I think really one of the biggest eyesores in our community, those old shuffleboard courts that hadn't been used in decades. Um, and so uh, the, we demoed those uh, recently uh, and with the idea that, that we would do something that was very limited in nature. And the reason, and, and I'm talking about landscaping and a couple of picnic tables, very limited. Um, uh, very passive, no, you know, there's not going to be anything there that would generate activity. M the thinking is, you know, maybe people coming to the pool might sit there and, and have a bite to eat or something before they go into the pool area and uh, something like that. Uh, maybe a place to hang out uh, during fireworks or other things that are going on, the events we have, uh, that's a big event area. So very limited, very low cost. And the reason we got there is because prior to demoing those, we did a, a pretty fr full forensic study of uh, the Clubhouse 2 Annex. And the report came back, don't spend much money on this building because it is really poorly built in the first place and deteriorating uh, very rapidly. All the paper's gone, it's got extensive dry rot. Um, and it's not, an, it's not a danger, but and you can get maybe five or ten years out of it, but it, it's not a, a long-term solution. And so the thinking from staff is, okay, we'll do something that's interim here that doesn't cost, no real hard, not a lot of concrete, not a lot of things we have to tear out later, do minimal work on the annex, paint, carpet, keep the air conditioning working, that's about it. And then at some point down the road, a different staff and a different board can decide what to do with that whole site when that building has to come down. And so you'll have the the passive, uh, uh, really landscaped area or park, and then the annex, which at some point will have to come down. And then you'll have a nice building pad that somebody can do something with, uh, uh, maybe a building, who knows, maybe it'll be time for sand volleyball courts at that time, I don't know. But whatever choices um, the board at that time needs to make, we don't want to interfere with that by putting something in that has to be removed 
Right. Um, and, yes. And and this has nothing to do with a building. We don't. No, 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 building. no, no. We don't do. I anything. mean, we other than paint. Uh, that's about the yeah. extent of what we would do to that. And that's why <laughs> that building, a passive park. That's what we're talking about. Yes. Some land. So I think that'll be a very nice site do down too. the road for some use that 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 a future board may want to want to do. Jim. Your mic, so that they can hear. At the last M and C meeting, this was on the agenda, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a big discussion on it, um, and a lot was said. What Brad is saying, and and also, uh, it's possible that we could have a little, uh, um, uh, a little uh, snack bar that would have hot dogs like they used to have at the old uh, um, golf starter building. And, um, and anyway, uh, but then there, there were arguments about, well, maybe that could be used as a parking lot. Uh, maybe uh, um, some other things. Anyway, we took the boat and it was, um, it was a four to three and that it passed that we would recommend that this move forward. Did your conversation have to do with attaching something to a building or? No, no, it's just putting tables out on this vacant property, which is 90 by 90. That's, mm -hmm. you know, that's a big. So that's what we're. Yes. I thought, the pro I thought the proposal voted on cut out an archway, so it touches yes. the annex building. And it also had concrete steps uh, coming up from the parking lot down the middle and then concrete on either side. Right. I mean, that's just what was in the plan. Yep. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's an older design okay. that was done before we had an idea of how bad that building was and, and what its future was going to be. Um, See, that, yeah. that, that area is about oh, four or five feet above the, uh, the um, parking area down below. Mm -hmm. So you need some steps going up to that little. That. You don't use the ramp up. Otherwise, I think it's the ramp up the side. Is that the other way? Yes, that, that's what I was thinking. We would try to try to work off of that, and not spend a bunch of money on concrete we have to tear out later. Well, I just want to make sure we're talking about the passive park project and not buildings and all kinds of other things. No, it, it's there's nothing. There's nothing there but tables and chairs. Are we clear on that, everyone? The other thing that I mentioned, and just I want to keep this in your mind, in the staff report for, for that, um, was the um, electrical capacity there. It, it's got a, now we've, we've, we've taken, <laughs> taken the equipment and moved it off site, but there's a, a lot of capacity uh, there if you wanted to do electric charging stations or something like that for EVs, there's a, there's a lot of, a lot of capacity the, to do that there. The snack bar issue, I would like not to be involved in this, and this is why. Our new golf operations manager has mentioned they, they would like to make some kind of a hot dog thing where golfers between, which is common, between rounds could drive through, grab a hot dog on the run, and go play another nine. Right. And also, it would be a revenue uh, believe me, uh, that would sell. I mean, okay. Uh, so he's looking at that, and we. He's, he told me he says I don't know exactly where I would propose it yet, but he would like to do that in the future. So that's why I say I'm in favor of a park, a passive park. I think it's a good idea. I'm in favor of that. I don't want any buildings touched. I don't want to go crazy here. Um, we don't want to create a security issue where we need more parking. We don't. Uh, so that's my input. Yeah. So as long as everybody understands, when we say passive park, that's what we're talking about, then I'll call for a vote. Uh, President Circle, we do have some requests to speak before oh. you call for a vote. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't... Yeah, the board's first. Go ahead. Okay, um, I wanted to speak on this issue. Um, I'm... Basically, I think we're going to have a huge pro parking problem, and we have never addressed that because we now have the lawn bowling being resurfaced. We've got the pool. We've got golf. We've got paddle tennis. 
We've got Clubhouse too. And we've already addressed the fact that on Thursday or Friday nights, I know you know it uh, gets busy there. We've got the 19th restaurant and bar facility, and parking is an issue there. And we haven't enforced that golfers park their carts below. So. Um, what I can see with the passive park actually is like 4th of July celebrations, Woodstock and everything else, and that and contributing to more parking also. And I just think that we need to table this and look at this a little bit more. I don't see a parking problem if it's truly a passive park. That is, if it's just tables and, and lawn where people can go from the pool to sit and you're not building stairs, we're inviting people to come to an event. Uh, I would go along with that, but I agree with Annette, if we are going to make it an extension of what's already there and make Woodstock and everything else part of it, it's, it would be huge. But if it's truly a passive park, like um, little parks that do exist around the village, uh, the Serpentine Walk, for example, where people are not invited for a large event, I think that's fine, and, but I do not favor anything more. I think after listening to Mr. Matson in his committee, the vote was four to three, which means it was very tight. There was a lot of both sides. Uh, Annette, who chairs the security uh, committee, has got some security concerns about parking. And um, I would like to see uh, Mr. Tim Moy take a look at the project we're suggesting, the Passive Park, and see if there would be any parking or security issues and related to this. Uh, this, to me, is like two committees working together, which is would be wonderful if you took MNC and worked with security to make sure the project that they're proposing uh, has the uh, security support and, and issues, and then we take into consideration their concerns, uh, it would be better, and the only way to do that is to send it back to MNC for further with help with the security committee, as I see it. That's my input. Anyone else? Well, I don't think you can leave it the way it is. It's got, it's got construction uh, fencing around it, and so it can be dirt, it can be grass, and you just need to pick one, um, that's that, or concrete. <laughs> you got three choices. What do we want to do? <clears throat> and this is only to design a real preliminary plan for a passive park so that it can go back to MNC. This isn't to build okay. it. So we I, do I, need this vote today. Okay, so I understand that and I'm in favor of it. Okay. I think there are people we, outside. We have so one request 200. to speak. Um, I think also at that meeting, uh, microphone. 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 Yeah. I can't hear. I can't. It's not for me. It's for me. It's on now. Yeah. Okay. I turned it off. He turns off. Uh, thanks. Uh, the thing is, the, that big walk walkway to get up to the building was all stairs. There was no ramps or anything else included that would get people from point A to point B. And I think that'll, that'll be looking at it, too, as you know. Well, uh, judging by what Lori was saying, it appears that if we approve this, it will all be looked at, and all of that will be yeah. taken into consideration. And then we'll also we'll have some input from security, and it seems to me that it would work. So that it's forward. the right thing to do. Yes. When this plan, I was at the MNC meeting, when this plan was presented, it was presented kind of almost like an as is, um, that this was going to be the steps, there was going to be the side ramp for the, accommod the accommodation, uh, the public accommodation, and we needed the money, the eighty dollars to $100,000 for the fees to draw something up, and there were at least six, six to eight picnic tables proposed mm -hmm. around that walkway going up. Um, so that doesn't... Uh, Okay, that's just for consideration. That, that's not what we're re recommending with this agenda item. We, we reworked it, and um, what we really need is a holding pattern. That's why we're calling it an interim park, so that 
GRF, future GRFs can hold charrettes and determine what is the next thing needed in the village. Do we need a parking structure? Do we need a large multi-story building for clubs to meet in? What is necessary? And that's going to take years to get into and fund and all of that. So what this is is only, uh, you know, ten or twenty thousand dollars to get a designer to design a real passive park to go back to MNC to vote on. I, I think that's that summarizes the whole deal right there. Oh, excuse me. The architect is seven thousand six hundred and forty-five dollars, okay. and the project itself will likely be within my spending authority. So, Jim, do you really want to see this again? <laughs> Either way. Um, so I, it's a very minimalist approach. No steps. Use existing facilities just to make it look halfway decent for tell some future date. Yeah. Diane. Sorry, I wish I hadn't um, put that I in speak there. in favor of this motion, although I did vote against this particular design that came up because I was afraid of the cutting into the building and stuff. But, uh, but I speak in favor of this. I think what we're really trying to do is just make it look pretty enough so we can move forward. Yeah, this, this design came up uh, probably a year ago and was rejected. We would just get, it went to, I think the landscape committee looked at this, uh, if I recall, for the, you know, it had a lot of landscaping in it, and it was just rejected. And so I don't know why they included this in the staff report, and I apologize for that in confusion, because I rejected it, John rejected his committee rejected. We just said, ah, don't do that. Don't spend that kind of money there. It's interim. So I apologize. Do you have a question? Let's vote. All in favor? Wait, 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 wait. Okay. We can't vote until we hear our member oh, comments. Right. I have one okay, Skillman sorry. that requested to speak. I apologize. I'm new at this there. <coughs> You'll get used to it. <laughs> I think the confusion is in our packet. Yes. Page 1 of 12 is the endorsement from the MNC committee, which is not for the interim passive park, but for the Planning design consultant for the building yes. clubhouse two building renovation. Yes. And <clears throat> one of that part is to renovate uh, or, or to put in the passive park. But it also talks about EV charging stations, which would be very difficult yeah. with a passive park. Yeah. And um, parking issues. And I have to agree with Director Soleil that parking is a problem up there. And using this for a park, who would use it? We have a park across the street that belongs to the city that if people want to go picnic and have a little park there, there's one there. Um, I don't know if anything, it would be people who are using the swimming pool that want to go someplace and eat or whatever. Um, we need parking. We need parking for that whole area up there, whether it's another parking lot or a parking building or whatever. We need parking. So I would just ask that um, if, in fact, what we are voting on is only an engineer to look at that specific area that they include in their purview, um, looking at it for other things besides just a grass area for parking. I agree. So, any, anybody, any other comments from the community? I tend to agree. Um, I don't like the fact that we have a packet saying it's one thing and we're trying to say it's something else right now. Well, I think all they're asking you to do is approve the designer for $7,000. Okay. Okay. For a park. For a park. Oh, and, and in that design, we will require that parking issues and stuff like that is looked at. This site won't work for parking. I, it, it maybe if you spend a lot of money, you can get half a dozen spaces up there, but it's very awkward. Not yeah. All it's right. not well, suited. Call for the vote. We have a motion, right? We have a motion. It's been first and seconded. All in favor? All opposed? passes. Okay. A little confusing, but we did it. Okay. Huh? Now, 
Are we not to item 13 now? Oh, we're on 11 11 a. a. Okay, 11 A. That's right. Entertain a motion to approve contractual matters, Clubhouse 7. Yeah, Main Lodge Wood Floor Replacement. We have a resolution. Secretary, please read the resolution. Resolution 90-17-XXX. Supplemental Appropriation Clubhouse 7 Main Lounge Wood Floor Replacement. Whereas Clubhouse 7 was constructed in 2005 and the main lounge was designed to host dances and assorted events. Due to years of heavy usage, the wood floor has become severely damaged. And in 2012, approximately 10% of the floor was replaced with a different material, leaving the new section of flooring with a contrasting color. Whereas on September 6, 2016, the GRF board approved refinishing Clubhouse 7 main lounge wood floor as part of the 2017 Capital Reserves Expenditures Plan with an appropriation of $11,000 to refinish only, funded from the facilities fund. Whereas staff inspected the floor in 2017 and found substantial damage beyond the surface imperfections. Many areas of floor planking have large gaps rather than tightly joined together, allowing unwanted movement. And whereas the Golden Rain Foundation recognizes the need to replace the flooring completely rather than repair it. Now therefore, be it resolved, December 5th, 2017, the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby approves a supplemental appropriation in the amount of $33,375 to be funded from the facilities fund for a total project cost of $44,375 and that a contract be awarded to BMI Installations, Inc. in order to replace the wood flooring in the main lounge of Clubhouse 7 and resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. I so move. I second. Second. Discussion? Yes, Jim. Uh, this, <clears throat> this, this was approved at our MNC meeting. Um, subsequent to that, and I, I'm new on the board, so I decided to go down and look at that floor. And, um, and I determined that there's a way to fix these big holes in the floor. And, um, and, and so uh, I talked to Ernesto and I told him, you know, I think this floor can be fixed by just sanding it and resurfacing it. And there's, I showed him how the floor can be fixed. So, um, so he said he'd take a look at it and get his uh, consultant and go down and look at the floor again and with this new information. Last Friday, I went over to Ernesto, and he said, uh, well, let me tell you what happened. Um, I got this consultant. We went back down there again, and he showed me how the floor could be fixed and said, so, therefore, uh, I agree with you that the floor should be sanded and finished, and that will take care of it. You'll save $33,000, and, 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 and also, that because of the work that would be done, it can be done in the budget, Ernesto saying this, that I have. So you don't need to go to the board and get a motion for the $33,000. So he said, I'm, I can right now, can go ahead and do that and stop, and stop the whole thing. So if you go to Ernesto, it's all over. And so what we're doing here is voting on something and, and I tried to get this thing um, removed from the agenda, but it, you know, it got in the here, so I had to go through this. But I think so, it's over, and we're going to save me $33,000, and we're going to come up with a nice floor. Okay. I'm cool with that. Did it, I have one question. Did you have an opportunity, you probably didn't have an opportunity to talk to your committee. Is, this was just that's you. true. That's true. Yeah. I, okay. Yes, Diane. 
So what you're saying is we could just vote no on this? Or we just withdraw the request. Okay. If there's or, or, a motion to do this, to just vote no. Right. Yeah. Which is easier. Which is easier. To withdraw it or to vote no? I, 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 can't, can't, withdraw it. It I can't withdraw it. I think. Oh, can't. Or whoever I, made I, the motion I have can withdraw it. The, the motion is on yeah, the floor. Yeah, this is confusing. Because this is, we're talking about a recommendation from staff of what we should do. And then our chair of MNC is coming with another idea. Uh, could Brad kind of clarify what's going yeah, on? Yeah, well, I think um, Ernesto took a peek at it uh, at the request of the chair. He and I actually went over this morning and looked at it again. This doesn't solve the two-tone piece because they, they repaired a piece of it um, with a different color of wood. Um, it, it's pretty beat up, but I think it would be, be repaired. Um, it's uh, So... Yeah, I think it's uh, if we're satisfied with that, we should go ahead and do it. Jim, and I think it'll 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 be practical. I well, think. if we vote this down, then that's what we'll do. Sure, Jim. Yeah. There's a motion, and uh, on just to say, withdraw the motion. No, you can't. No, we're going. What we will do is we will it's, vote. If it if it goes down, then that's what we'll. we'll it's we'll, been placed okay. on the floor by the chair. Right. Therefore, there is a motion. There's that a must motion. be voted on. Right. I have another. Beth, one more. So, Brad, I need a little bit more clarification. Okay. So, um, so if we can repair this, uh, visual, visually it would be different, different colors. Uh, talk to me about lasting and durability of the repair versus do to put in a new uh, and are we are being are we being wise or are we being penny wise and pound foolish I really don't know wood floors last quite a long time if maintained properly this has not been maintained properly but I don't think it's 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 so bad that it can't be be restored um, also, because we originally thought, well, let's just get rid of this. And there's some really good vinyl materials now that, that work about as good as wood. And we're always dragging tables across there and all that, you know, what it does to wood floors a lot of times. And so we were thinking about that. But then when we looked at the installation aspect of it, there's, there's an indentation uh, in, the, in the floor where that wood is sort of floating. And so if you took that off and you wanted to put vinyl down that whole thing, you'd have to do a whole concrete project to fill up. Yeah. That hole. And so that kind of messed up our plan originally. And so then we thought, well, it's such a mess. Maybe we just start over again and, and maybe go wall to wall in, instead of having, having this indentation there because the carpet always gets ruffled up around the edges and things. You've seen that before. So I think after all the looking at it, I think Jim's suggestion is probably the best. Just finish it and redo the carpet. We have money for that in a different project and call it a day, and, and then maintain it properly. OK, this, so what do we, do? we have another. And that's all within my authority if you, if you don't do this. <laughs> we have one request to speak. OK. Maxine McIntosh. Well, Brad just gave some of the clarity I needed. I just hope that you do vote this down so you can follow the last suggestion that he made. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Palmer. Yeah, I, uh, on page uh, 4 of 6, 11 a, <clears throat> that gap in the floor, I, I use Clubhouse 7, and I never saw anything like that. OK. So I think it, 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 I know there's two tones. That doesn't bother me. I mean, <laughs> a floor is a floor. <laughs> OK. All right. Um, no, let me, Jim. That the gap, there's a number of gaps, but they're on the perimeter of the floor where the wood floor stops and it goes to, toward the wall. And there's a big rubber seal that goes along there that, that's the interface between the, the wood floor and the, and the material on the floor going to the wall. I lifted up this big rubber thing, and here, it, here you you can see that piece of wood. There's a piece of wood, and it's not a, really a hole. It's, it's a piece of wood that came loose and went into this area on the, on the interface between the two. So all you got to do is take a little hammer and push that piece of wood that goes right back in. 
and the, the seal. Okay. I, I think uh, it's time to take a vote. Uh, the motion is on the floor. All in favor? Could we repeat the motion? Could Joan repeat the motion? I can repeat the motion if you'd like. Or Cheryl, can you repeat the Yes. The motion on the floor is to approve the um, contractual matters for Clubhouse 7, Main Lounge, Wood Floor Replacement. And the motion um, was already first, and, second. first second. and seconded. Right. So all in favor of this motion? Opposed? We just saved $33,000, and um, I want first line lunches when we have here for the rest of the year. Thank you, Jim. So, but now don't we need mm -hmm. another motion? No. Nope. Mm -hmm. No. Need no. 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 Okay. Man. Uh, let me see here. New business 13, right? A. Entertain a motion to approve the GRF committee appointments by resolution. And the copy is on uh, the newest, latest, and last list is for you. Go ahead and read the res uh, resolution, please. Resolution. <laughs> resolution 90 17 X. GRF committee appointments. Resolved December 5th, 2017, that the following persons are hereby appointed and ratified to serve on the committees of this corporation. Business planning, Diane Phelps for GRF, Tom Circle for GRF, Rosemary DiLorenzo for third, Steve Parsons for third, Gary Morrison for United, Juanita Skillman for United, Nancy Howe, Mutual 50. Community Activities Committee, Beth Perrick is chair from GRF, Joan Milliman vice chair, GRF, Joanne DiLorenzo for GRF, Jules Sellen for third, to be arranged as second, third member, Janie Durrell for United, Andre Torm for United, Reiner Rothberg for Mutual 50, non-voting advisors, Leon St. Hilaire and Gail Gomez. Finance Committee, Diane Phelps, Chair for GRF, Annette Subble Soul, Vice Chair for GRF, Thomas Circle for GRF, Rosemary DiLorenzo for third, Steve Parsons for third, Bill Walsh, the alternate for third, Gary Morrison for United, Juanita Skillman for United, Nancy Howe, Mutual 50, non-voting advisors. Uh, there are two vacancies. For maintenance and construction and energy, Jim Madsen, chair for GRF, Richard Palmer, vice chair for GRF, Beth Parrott, GRF, John Frankel for third, Bert Moldau for third, Bunny Carpenter, alternate for third, Steve Leonard for United, Don Tibbetts for United, Reiner Rothberg for Mutual 50, non-voting advisors, John Luby, and one vacancy. PAC Renovation Ad Hoc Committee, Beth Perrock, Chair for GRF, Joan Milliman, Vice Chair for GRF, Richard Palmer, GRF, John Frankel, third, Bill Walsh, third, Steve Leonard, third, United, Juanita Skillman, United, Irving Wayland, Mutual 50. Non-voting advisors, Sheila Bialka and John Perrick. For Media and Communications Committee, Joan Milliman, Chair for GRF, Beth Perrick, Vice Chair for GRF, Diane Phelps for GRF, Bert Baum for third, Susan Kane for third, Maggie Blackwell, United, Stephen, Steve Leonard for United, Non-voting advisors are Steve Carmen, John Perrick, and Lucy Parker. Mobility and Vehicles Committee. Judith Troutman is chair for GRF. Ray Gross, vice chair for GRF. Joanne DiLorenzo for GRF. Steve Parsons, third. John Frankel for third. Bert Moldau, alternate third. Cash Ashokar, United. Reza Bastani, United. June Greenwald, Mutual 50. Non-voting advisors are Marion Levine, Marion Levine and Gloria Moldau. Security and Community Access Committee, Annette Sabal Sol, Chair, GRF, Ray Gross, Vice Chair, GRF, Jim Juhan, GRF, Steve Parsons, Third, J 
John Frankel, third, Susan King, alternate, third, Pat English, united, Don Tibbetts, united, non-voting advisor, uh, Larry Cunningham, with one vacancy. Laguna Woods Village traffic hearings, Ray Gross for GRF, Jules Salon, third, John Frankel, alternate for third, Cash Ashrakar for United, board members by rotation for Mutual 50. Resolve further that Resolution 90-17-24, adopted June 6th, 2017, is hereby superseded and canceled. And resolve further that the officers and agents of the corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. I so move. Jim, second. So, second. And uh, is uh, Bill Walsh alternate GRF? Is that a Bill Walsh is I read that. third. Okay. So yeah. Once we we have a first, do we have a second? Second. Okay. It's All in favor? Second. Opposed? One other thing on this particular subject. Um, Jim, third, uh, Jim Juhan, third board has asked for a member of this board to sit on their energy committee, and I've selected you to do that. Will, Bill Walsh is the chair. Okay. Sure. Uh, please that. contact him as soon as possible. Yeah. And Tim, the Tim, Tim, their energy. And I think they revised this. This one has. Yeah. Um, yeah. It did not say Bill Walsh. Okay. This one's done. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. How about 13B? Reappointment of Dan Kenny to VMS board for the three year term. Who? Dan Kenny. Dan. Can I? What do we need? We need to vote on this, do we not? Do I need a motion? I don't move. I second. Discussion? Who? Who are you? Okay. I got it. All in favor? Unanimous. Opposed? No. Unanimous. Congratulations, Congratulations sir. Uh, yeah, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> Look forward to working with you, sir. Okay. Uh, Fort, huh? Thirteen. Fort? Thirteen. We just did committees. We just reappointed him. So now it's committee reports, item 14. All right, we'll start right out with finance, Ms. Director Diane Phelps. Okay, we will start with the slides, please, Cheryl. You tell me when. How about this, while she's getting the slides up, I will mention that um, we made the last payment on the 15-year loan that we had on this building so that uh, I can say we are officially debt-free. Sweet. Okay, so that slide two. Join, we're debt-free. So, okay, thank you. So, okay, so slide one. Uh, through October 31st, total revenue for GRF was 33402000 compared to expenses of 33765000 resulting in net expense of 363000 Next slide. <clears throat> this chart shows activity and operation separate from reserve and contingency fund activity. After backing out depreciation, which is not funded through operations, we had an operating deficit of almost $1.6 million through October. <clears throat> the board planned for an operating deficit of $1.8 million for the year as a means of returning prior year surplus to members. In addition, supplemental funding was approved by the board at our last GRF meeting to cover unanticipated costs. So we're doing okay. Slide three. Uh, when we compare the October 31st figures to budget, we do see that GRF is worse by a budget of about $110,000, with the most significant variances attributable to temporary help in overtime, materials and supplies, utilities, as well as legal fees. But as I mentioned, supplemental funding was approved for payment of a judgment with legal fees. Uh, slide four. 
On the other hand, we were better than budget in the following areas, the trust facilities fee, fuel and oil, income tax, and insurance. Slide five. On this pie chart, we show the non-assessment revenues received to date of 800, uh, I'm sorry, 8,744,000 by category. Our largest revenue generating operation is broadband services, followed by the trust facilities fee, golf operations, and clubhouse rentals. These revenues help offset costs and keep the assessments down. Slide six, expenses to date of, uh, yeah, of $33,765,000 million, $33 million are shown here on a pie chart by category. The largest categories being compensation, depreciation, cable TV, and utilities. And then last but not least, the reserve and contingency fund balances are shown on slide seven. Through October 31st, additions to reserves have been 5,444,000 for the year. About 3 million of that was in assessments, assessments, about 2 million was in trust facilities fees, and the rest, just over $300,000 was interest. So that's the total of $5,444,000 <clears> that went into reserves. Although funds show a combined balance on the first column of 35,296,000, we have work in progress as well as many projected expenditures approved by the board through the capital plan or via supplemental operations. So after we consider those commitments, the unencumbered fund balances as of the end of October totaled $21,754,000, well above our threshold. Okay, so that's it for the financial slides. Um, as for the Finance Committee meeting, we did not have a November meeting. Our next meeting will be Wednesday, December 20th at 1.30 in the, this boardroom. Items on our agenda for discussion um, will include the pickleball courts, as we mentioned, um, and also the trust facilities fee. Um, we've been asked to put it on to, to consider whether or not we'll have an exemption for people who are just selling their primary residence and, and either buying up or buying down. Um, and the only other thing I'll mention is that the GRF representative to the Select Audit Task Force has resigned, so we're looking for a replacement. If you're interested, you can contact me or stay tuned for information on how to apply um, that will be coming out shortly in the Globe or via email blast. And that's it for finance. Kept it short. Thank you very much. Uh, I invite the community to come to the Community Activities Committee meetings. There are so many things that happen that you can find out about. Um, so we, in our meeting, our, our last meeting, November 9th, we had um, <coughs> our recreation director, Brian Gruner, gave uh, just kind of a, a summarization, rundown of activities, recent activities. And there are so many new activities offered in the village because of our recreation department coming up with all these creative ideas and things to do that are entertaining and fun and not costly at all. Um, uh, just a little item of note, um, Mr. Gruner received third place in the member golf tournament. Mm -hmm. He received a $100 prize and he donated it to the foundations and we're eternally grateful for any donations. And Mr. Gruner also introduced in that meeting Tom McRae, the new golf operations manager, and he talked to us about the task and, and um, plans, his plans for the future. Also introduced was Sean Rincata as the golf maintenance manager, which is now under recreation. So golf maintenance is now under, under CAC, which is recreation, which is CAC. And then we had Jennifer Murphy, which I'm sure that so many of you know her, highlighted upcoming events, which was this huge long list, one of, one of which was the Thanksgiving Buffet, the Holiday Festival, uh, and Clubhouse Two, and just many, many, many events. Ms. Ms. Murphy also introduced Matt Gray, who was a, was the recipient of the service award that we have for um, VMS. 
he, Matt, stated that he is very happy to be working here, looks forward to be in a long-term position. And he's working in Clubhouse 2, so to congratulate him, if you happen to be in Clubhouse 2, give a, give a uh, shake of the hand to Matt. Member comments, let's see what else I wanted to tell you. The other thing that we talked about was the uh, swimming pool, and we talked about that this morning, the extending um, the uh, pilot study to not charge the rates for swimming pool in the summer when the children, if children are visiting grandchildren. And that's it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Maintenance Construction Committee, Jim Matson. Oh, okay. <clears throat> The MNC is essentially all about uh, projects. We have currently 24 projects that uh, we're working on here, and they range from uh, $19,000 to uh, close to $800,000. So it's a, there are lots of things going on here now. <clears throat> the um, meeting that we had, our last MNC meeting, um, we got, uh, and which is, occurs at every meeting, we get updates on these various projects by staff. And, uh, and that is almost the whole meeting. And that uh, we discuss things back and forth, which, and had a great meeting. Also, uh, we have a closed meeting, uh, which is contract matters, where we mm -hmm. um, get the chance to um, select a contractor and the the price that they're uh, bidding and uh, proposing for the job. And so that's essentially uh, my bid. And your next meeting is January 10th, right? Yeah, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Report from the Performing Arts Center. Beth. Um, we had the input from the clubs and the community, and where we are with this now is the architects are taking into consideration the suggestions from all of our clubs, and they'll be coming back to us with, with um, you know, additional ideas, taking into account the things that we requested. Thank you. Uh, actually, we, yes, can sir. I say one thing? Sure. Um, before I got this um, handout, mm -hmm. What I told you was true, but there's a word added on to this thing now. It says energy. I and noticed it's, that. It's <laughs> not supposed to be there. Oh, really? Okay. I don't think. Because I'm not sure what that scope of that is. MNC, is that the way it's been? I noticed it myself. I didn't, I should have. Uh, maintenance, construction, and energy? Yeah, no, it should just be MNC. Yeah. No energy. Just well, MNC. He's going to do energy with third. No energy. I, yes. I thought that energy was moved into M and C. Right, but we don't need to write it on there. No, I know, but I mean that's it's, yeah. It's, it's, automatic. Uh, it's, it's automatic, but he will be dealing with third screw. Got it. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that, Jim. All right, uh, meeting communications, Joan. Our last meeting was in October and we reported on it last month. Our next meeting is this month, December the 18th on a Monday, here in the boardroom at 1.30. Um, I'm going to recommend that this committee meet every month because it are, they get pretty long otherwise and staff has to do too much preparation. So December 18th, 1.30, here in the boardroom. And I'm okay with your recommendation. Thanks. Yes. Good. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, mobility and vehicles. Judith's not here. How about Ray? Can you just. Report? Yes, I can. I was going to say that. Thank you. Uh, first off, uh, one thing that's really important that was mentioned at the meeting is that on uh, the 18th, 19th, and 20th, the city has determined that they're going to do slurrying on El Toro between Moulton and uh, uh, north of there, which means that gates one and five will not be accessible at all. Therefore, there's gonna be some challenges as to people getting in and out with the busing. The bus committee is working on that, staff is working on that to make some, some clearances. There was a lot of complaints and almost a request that the committee do these changes, and I expressed to them that committee has the ability to take it to the 
to the boards and let the boards make the determination. We, and they were quite a few people were surprised. Um, and in addition, there, there were lots of complaints about, well, when people get on the buses, it's either the lift chairs or this or that or the other. And they want to have new buses or new devices where when people come aboard with wheelchairs and uh, carts and so forth, they're in the aisle way, people can't get in and out, and they, they get hurt and they fall down and so forth. That's also being addressed. Staff looked into everything that was being said, and they're really, really going to be working on this and try to do something uh, as quick as possible. Uh, like I said, the most important thing is that the information will be put out pretty quickly uh, from us as well as from the city about the El Toro. That's really important that you know that. That's probably enough. <laughs> yeah, sir. Thank you. Uh, how about security and community access, Annette? Good morning, or I should say good afternoon. Uh, security consists of security, compliance, and social services. And security encompasses traffic and disaster preparedness, whose reports will follow. Uh, basically, we're going to focus this year on gates, the dwelling live, the RFIDs, the 2018 building captains. And uh, for disaster preparedness, we're looking at generators for the care and reception centers at the clubhouses and the medical logistics. And speaking about that, yesterday I uh, met with Chief Moy along with James Juhan, and this is uh, who was Chief Moy today, is at the Orange County Healthcare, who was able to provide a grant to private businesses, and that includes this private community under their business uh, terms, this business program we qualify. So we're going to be able to secure for free all medical and uh, medicines kind of devices in case of an emergency, and we have to figure out to dispense it, the logistics of that. So the chief is looking at all that, and this is concerning the distribution of much needed medical supplies. The other thing that this committee uh, discussed was we'll be reviewing the uh, schedule of traffic and monetary fees and penalties and the lack of consistency because there's 10 violations with no fines. We're also going to be looking at um, training more residents to use Dwelling Live from their smartphones because right now uh, we have about 3,000 using it and we'd like to triple or quadruple that amount and get it up to about at least, you know, almost everyone. <laughs> Currently with Dwelling Live, there's a problem encountered with large group events. Residents are not allowed, you know, in the gate. And they basically, in order to uh, circumvent that right now temporarily, when there are loop, large group events, the uh, members have to go through resident services in order to manage that glitch. We're trying to work on that right now. And our meeting, uh, our first meeting will be held on December 21st at 1.30 p.m. in the boardroom. Thank you. Thank you. Does that also include disaster preparedness, I would think? No, disaster. No, okay. Jim Juhan will address okay. that. Okay. All right. Uh, Ray Gross, traffic hearings? Uh, yes, I'll just add a little bit to what was said before. As to security, I made mention this earlier, and people don't understand that we do have the foot patrol, which encompasses fire issues, hazards, lights, maintenance, perimeter fences, pests, and signs. And then they turn that information in to staff, and they make the repairs and so forth and so on. And once again, uh, most of our uh, notices for traffic hearing are due to stop signs, speed, and believe it or not, uh, limited parking and expired registration. People think because they're of age, say, 75 or so, they don't need to have their new license and they don't have to have their vehicles registered, and that's not so. Uh, in any event, we also, um, at the traffic hearing itself the other day, we had a total of 15 people there, and here again, uh, most of it is because of speed uh, and, and stop signs mostly uh, and a lot of parking situations, and we handle this. But the important thing here is that people don't understand, we constantly get complaints, well, why can't you play Let's Make a Deal? You know, instead of giving me a notice of violation or a ticket. So what happens at the traffic hearing, for instance, we've had uh, notices of, of uh, citations issued, we've had over 2,100. We've had a uh, number of fines issued of 368. Monetary fines imposed were 1,830. There were 213 suspended. That's really important. 
because the officers are told they can't uh, play, uh, like I say, give them a warning. They don't give them the notice of violation, and then the court system takes care of it if there is a challenge, uh, so forth. And then we explain to people, because of medical uh, situations and so forth, what they need to do to tell the officer. Then that is expressed to us, and then we, we do uh, then play a, a deal here. And then the traffic school, there were 34 different people uh, in, involved in that for sure. And uh, that uh, is, is about the size of it for that. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. Um, again, disaster preparedness, Jim Juhin. I have been uh, going to the uh, the last uh, dust uh, with uh, let me see no oh the disaster preparedness task force uh, and I, I, this is a. a was given to me by Judith, who is a secretary. Um, the last meeting was November 28th. We are once a month uh, to review and practice the emergency operations plan. Our plan is now synchronized uh, with the city of Laguna Woods, Orange County, California State, uh, in accordance with the FEMA requirements. Uh, we encourage residents to step up and volunteer to be a good neighbor captain for your building. Uh, I imagine we say this every month, so I'm not going to repeat it. But what I add is, right now, there are two major fires burning in Southern California. One is Thomas Fire near San Paula, 130 miles from where we are here. The other one is Creek Fire from Pasadena near uh, Lakeview Terrace, which is 60 miles away. I would like you to turn your TV on tonight and look at what's going on, and then go find somebody to be uh, volunteered for your building or get somebody to do that. Thank you. OK, item 15, future agenda items. Entertain a motion to adopt a resolution for the golf Green fees for 2018. It's it's 15A. We don't have to take a motion. Yeah, I am. Oh. No problem. I'm not hungry. You want a motion? We should have. I think I Okay. Aren't right. these, these are things that didn't it's satisfy the 30 days. Yeah. So that we'll do this on the, at the next, because November's a short month. Next. And so we'll, these will be for the January. Got it. Okay. Uh, we have a resolution. B, entertain a motion to adopt a resolution for members' first policy. Mm -hmm. These are all future. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the reason why they're there is so we can be more transparent and let uh, residents know that they still have time to comment on those. I understand now. I understand now. Okay. So, uh, members first, the green fees for the, for the residents. Also, um, amending the recreational policy and operating rules is also in the 30 day notification. Um, entertain. A uh, motion for the contract work pass that we've been working on through security, uh, identifying a new system for passes for construction people. Uh, and of course, we'll in the future be looking at approving the uh, cable services fees. Okay. Uh, 16, director comments, starting with Jim Matson. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. My loss. Did you uh, vote on those where the 30-day notification had been satisfied? They've already been voted. We're just notifying people First that they're coming up. They've already been voted on. They're in the 30-day notification. We didn't have enough time. We didn't have 30 days between. We didn't have 30 days. So we'll be doing the next meeting. So we have the next meeting. Uh, I couldn't find a copy of the resolutions in my agenda. It isn't there. It's yeah, it isn't there. It's done before. Next time. First yeah. reading was what, last what, month. They'll be on the next agenda. I see. This is like a middle, a middle meeting. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, it's good, real good meeting. Um, I learned a lot, and um, so looking forward to the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Juhan. Uh, I'm the new kid on the block, and I hope to uh, get to know e each of you, and uh, I am not a person that comes in and makes a lot of noise, but uh, I have a lot of things to say. Excellent. Thank you. Diane. Um, I just want to wish everybody a happy holiday. Merry Christmas and happy uh, Hanukkah, which, should, which I guess will happen before our next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes, I neg neglected to say at, at the traffic deal, we have four judges that are there, and usually they're being rotated. The only reason that they're not being rotated is if a person is brand new on the committee, therefore I am the judge in charge. Uh, and in some cases, even the people that are on there normally say, I don't want to do it because, you know, so forth and so on. But there are going to be changes made and publicized along that. The last thing I have to say is that uh, Laguna Canyon Foundation, this was mentioned earlier, I do make sure that every month we have copies uh, from the Laguna Foundation put up at the front desk for your uh, picking up purposes. It has a lot of good information on it, and we have plenty up there. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. May, may I say something? Yes, Jim. Um, when I was on third one time, I was on the uh, committee with Ray that would interview people that had made mistakes. And I said, you know, Ray, we ought to get um, um, a go to Goodwill store or something and get some of these black robes that we can wear <laughs> in there. And so I think what we ought to do is give a nice big robe for Ray and his team to be someone. It's a very intimidating. So when the people come in, they won't argue. Well, I think the lawyers would probably have something to say about conducting. I handle it without too much court. court. <laughs> yes, Jim. Okay, I'll, I'll, I can give you four black uh, robes that are mine from being a, a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'd like to protest. Those are not, you are not judges. The people on this committee, and it's a traffic hearings, not a traffic uh, court. court. Yeah, traffic and right. all of our people that are on there do not consider themselves judges. <laughs> Thank you. I spoke in error being judges. It's traffic hearing. You're absolutely right. All right. Yeah. I want to say thank you, Tom, for your leadership, and I want to say welcome, new board. This is exciting, like a brand new adventure with everyone. And I echo what Diane said. Um, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Hanukkah, enjoy. Mr. Palmer. No comment. Annette. I want to say thank you um, to Jim for saving us some money today. That was, uh, that was wonderful. I'm really impressed. I just want to say I'm happy to be a part of this, and a happy holidays to everyone. Thank you. Joan. I just want to oh, I can get, to, get to the mic. I just want to say welcome to the new board members. It's going to be a pleasure having you and working with you together. And I, as the new secretary, am still learning names. <laughs> I'll get better as we go along. And I, too, wish you all a very happy holidays especially Happy New Year, and let's, let's do it. <laughs> uh, all I'm going to say is, uh, I, I said some comments earlier, uh, I will listen. I will be open to the directors. Um, we do this as a team, or we win, win as a team and we lose as a team. So I would appreciate your input. Um, I'm looking forward to the challenge. Um, obviously, you've seen I'm a little weak on the Maybe there's some of the little procedures, but I'll, I'll get better at that. Um, I'm a stickler for people making good, constructive comments to help us, and that's what I'd like the community to give. I want the community to get involved. As you, I've mentioned, I would like all of our committees to have resident advisors, and I would like all of the chairs to encourage the people to attend their committee meetings. Uh, it's very important. That's, I hear it all the time. Well, we don't know what's going on. We, you know, you voted this and you, we didn't know. Uh, to the community, get involved in the committees. That's where the work is done. That's where you can have an impact based upon whatever you want. 
And again, to the board, welcome everybody. Uh, I too wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Uh, we're in recess. We'll go up to to have lunch up on the is it the Willow Willow Room? In closed session.